Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the City of Bloomington Common Council meeting for this Wednesday, November the 16th. This is a regular session, and we will begin this evening by asking Clerk Bolden to please call the roll. Councilmember Smith? Here. Volan? Sims? Here. Scambalori? Here. Sandberg? Here. Rallo? Here. Clarity? Here. I'm sorry, I didn't. Here. Rosenbarger? Here. Piedmont Smith? Here. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. To summarize tonight's agenda, we do have three sets of minutes for approval. That will be followed by reports, beginning with council member reports. We have two reports this evening from the mayor and city offices, the housing development fund update from our hand director, and a report from Clerk Bolden regarding the AIM Ideas Summit. That will be followed by any report from council committees, and then our first opportunity this evening for public comment, and that is limited to 20 minutes, and so depending on how many hands go up, the time may be limited for that first opportunity followed by appointments to boards and commissions, if we have any this evening. And then we are on to legislation for second readings and resolutions. That will include Ordinance 22-15, to vacate a public parcel regarding a 12-foot wide alley segment running east-west between the Beeline Trail and the first alley to the west, north of 7th Street and the south of 8th Street, and that's Peerless Development Petitioner. Followed by Ordinance 22-33, to amend Title 10 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Wastewater Rate Adjustment. And then we will hear Ordinance 22-34 to amend Title 10 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Wastewater, the Stormwater Rate Adjustment. Legislation for first readings will include Appropriation Ordinance 22-05 to specifically appropriate from the general fund, public safety lit fund, ARPA Local Fiscal Recovery Fund, Parks and Recreation General Fund, the Jack Hopkins Fund, the Rental Inspection Program Fund, Local Road and Street Fund, Parking Facilities Fund, Solid Waste Fund, Fleet and Maintenance Fund, and Housing Development Fund expenditures not otherwise appropriated, appropriating various transfers of funds within the General Fund, Public Safety Lit Fund, ARPA, Local Fiscal Recovery Fund, Parks and Recreation General Fund, Local Road and Street Fund, Parking Facilities Fund, Solid Waste Fund, Fleet Maintenance Fund, and appropriating additional funds from the Jack Hopkins Social Services Fund, Rental Inspection Program Fund, and the Housing Development Fund. Then we will do a first reading for Ordinance 22-30 an ordinance authorizing the issuance of the City of Bloomington, Indiana General Revenue Annual Appropriation Bonds, Series 2022, to provide funds to finance the costs of certain capital improvements for public safety facilities, including costs incurred, incurred in connection with and on account of the issuance of the bonds and appropriating the proceeds derived from the sale of such bonds and addressing other matters connected therewith. Then Ordinance 22-35, to amend the Traffic Calming and Greenways Program incorporated by reference into Title 15, Vehicles and Traffic of the Bloomington Municipal Code regarding amending the Traffic Calming and Greenways Program incorporated by reference into Bloomington Municipal Code Section 15.26.020. We will then have our second opportunity for public comment, and that will be up to 25 minutes of comments for any individuals who have not spoken at the first opportunity, and matters not on this evening's agenda. And then we have a discussion of our council schedule before we will adjourn the meeting for this evening. So with that, we are ready for approval of minutes. Madam President, I move. Uh, approval of minutes for June 16th, 2021 regular session, July 21st, 2021 regular session, and August 18th, 2021 regular session. All right. Second. Moved and second, and I understand these minutes have already been amended. Are there any other amendments to the minutes? And seeing none then, all in favor, please say aye for approval of the minutes. Aye. 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 All right, anyone opposed? <coughs> All right, those minutes are approved. 
Now we will move to reports from council members. I will begin this evening to my far right, beginning with council member Smith. Thank you very much. I'd like to report as a member of the plan commission uh, what, what happened uh, on Monday, 11, 14, 22. We met a regularly scheduled meeting. Petitions, uh, Robert Shaw on Prow Road was a PUD. It's continued to the 12th of December meeting and the Cutters, uh, 115 East Kirkwood, is also uh, continued at December 12th. Uh, petitions that, that we heard, um, the one that's probably uh, on most people's minds is the detention center. We heard this, we had the second hearing about uh, the detention center that is being proposed by the county, um, yeah, the development of at I-69 in Fullerton Park. It was a really great discussion. We had a very robust and thorough discussion. Um, so there was uh, different questions. Um, the uh, planning and transportation recommended with a uh, negative recommendation. Their objections uh, were as follows. No site design. Uh, the site size was unclear. Uh, the location, uh, they wondered if there was other Places we that might that might happen, access uh, to transit bicycles and pedestrians, uh, and that didn't meet the comprehensive plan guiding document. Um, so we, you know, everybody had their chance, and I was very interested in it. I went out and had a site visit uh, with Councilmember Volin was there, and. Councilmember Piedmont Smith was was also there uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I I asked them about uh, the comprehensive uh, guy uh, plan and what was their major objection? Why was it a negative recommendation? From so I could understand, and mostly it was that it did not meet uh, the comprehensive plan as it is set forth at, in its existing state and with supporting documents from the UDO, which doesn't allow for a certain type of uh, development in, in that area, uh, which in this case would be the institution uh, of a jail, a detention center, um, it, because that zoning out there now is zoned for uh, mixed use uh, employment. So um, we we talked about it and had great discussion. Um, I asked a, a second question uh, if the conditional use for jail detention center was added to the UDO table uh, under mixed employment. Would that take away their objections? At, uh, as it wouldn't meet the plan. And planning and transportation sa staff said it, pro it likely would not take away their concerns and it wouldn't change their recommendation of a negative recommendation because the same issues and concerns would be present. Um, other commissioners wondered if we just didn't have enough information to make a decision. Um, we ended up ultimately after a robust and it must have been an hour plus this discussion, it was voted 6-3 uh, to accept the negative recommendation and forward it uh, to the city council. So that'll come before us at some point. Um, the next one was uh, St. Real Estate. Uh, it's at uh, 300, 300, 302 and 314 West First Street zoning map amendment. It's near the Hopewell property, uh, and there's three parcels there that are owned uh, privately, and they're asking for a rezoning so that it could be consistent with the other zoning in the area. Um, the city recommended, city staff recommended a positive recommendation as it would be consistent uh, with the zoning in the area. Two commissioners had to sit out uh, because of a potential conflict of interest, and it was passed 7-0 with a positive recommendation. The next one was the Hopewell site overlay. 
uh, it's a text amendment request for an overlay on the uni uh, related to the over unified development ordinance. City planning and transportation recommended approval. It seemed uh, this was the one we talked about with uh, alleys and uh, changing the mass of the buildings. I forgot exactly the, the score, the vote on it, but it was passed uh, with a positive recommendation um, and sent, it will be sent to the city council. The last one was uh, a zoning request. We ran out of time. Um, there's, there's some uh, time limits uh, on our uh, deliberation. So we are going to take up um, bounding some of the pop, uh, properties. Um, it's uh, zoning, or, zoning ordinance 52-22, and it uh, is around, surrounds the Hopewell area, and it's on that side of town, and it um, will be taken up in a special session on November 21st so that we can dispense of that and, and get that done. Um, lastly, I want to encourage anyone in the public who has questions about any of these proposals, um, send your questions to uh, Darla Frost at Plan Commission, and she will get them to the Plan Commission uh, members and president. Um, I think I've uh, related this and as accurately as I can remember and my notes allowed, and uh, so I, I will offer myself for any questions from uh, my uh, esteemed colleagues. Thank you very much. Councilmember Vola. Thank you, I've got a couple things. First, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Councilmember Smith for uh, a good idea, which is recounting the things that are happening at uh, Plan Commission. It's a unique contribution that I haven't seen before and it's helpful uh, to just have a summary of what's happening and uh, a, a basic sense of how the commission felt about it without going into too much details just right. I also want to endorse the idea that he brought up that he and I and Councilmember P. Smith discussed about how the land uh, that might become the new uh, jail and detention center and a justice complex might be built. The idea that we were discussing was uh, 200 years ago, the county created Bloomington by building the courthouse square and is there any reason why they can't do it again if they're gonna be relocating the justice complex to a, a piece of green uh, undeveloped uh, land? And that can that be more than just a monolith and that, that commerce can be there, that restaurants can be there, that offices can be there, that it can be a new part of town. I've uh, taken to calling it Justice Square. Uh, something to uh, echo the kinds of sentiments that uh, I found myself and people like uh, Councilor Rallo and Sandberg talking about with Hopewell that we don't want you know, monolithic buildings, we wanna break up the streetscape with alleys. We can do that at this place too. So I certainly endorse that idea and I hope that we can find something in the zoning to enable the county to build in such a way that it would enable other kinds of development. The only other thing I wanted to talk about was that today press release went out about boards and commissions and once again, um, because it's still on the books, uh, there's an advertisement for six alternate seats on the parking commission. Um, and I just wanna discourage uh, these seats from being filled. Uh, we, we have uh, one seat still to fill with a, uh, uh, with a citizen, uh, but uh, these alternates cannot participate in the meeting unless the person for whom they're the alternate is physically not present. Um, and uh, if we want advisors to advise the commission, we should name them to an advisory uh, a status. Uh, the commission is meeting tomorrow and that's one of the things that they're going to discuss. Uh, but uh, remember that this was a unique uh, ordinance we passed in March of 21 on the recommendation of city legal, uh, which they admitted was an experiment and not really well thought out and it's proven to be sort of uh, uh, not overkill, but just uh, an overdoing. I mean, no other commission um, has this, and it's, uh, uh, it, it, I'm not sure that the people who are being named to these seats are uh, benefiting uh, or can benefit uh, except in an emergency. 
So um, I would like to review this. I don't know if there's time on the schedule this year, if there's a Title II amendment coming forward or not. I'll have to look into it with uh, leadership and uh, council staff, but I just want to generally discourage this idea unless we really vet it in a new ordinance. So with that, uh, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to report. Thank you. Councilmember Sims. No report. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Scambori. No report. Thank you. All right. Very good. And to my left, we will start with Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I wanted to report from the Monroe County Solid Waste Management District Board, where I serve as the vice chair. Um, so we did have a budget of about $2.9 million that was recently approved by the county council. And uh, we included in the budget for 2023 two new positions that will be advertised soon. Um, one is for a waste reduction specialist that we hope um, can work with uh, city and county and especially with um, the private sector to uh, help businesses and institutions reduce their waste. Uh, the other new position is uh, support for existing programs. It's um, compliance, household hazardous waste, and landfill support staff position. So a little more technical and um, uh, just supporting existing programs. Um, we uh, have, um, we're looking ahead to October of 2024, which is when our current uh, host fee agreement with um, Republic Services will expire. Uh, a host fee is um, currently $2.75. Uh, that is collected by Republic uh, from people who bring their uh, waste to um, their facility to dump it. Um, and that uh, agreement was reached shortly after uh, the landfill was closed um, or as part of the closure of the landf landfill in 2004. It was a 20 year agreement. so. Um, we usually get about $250,000 at the Solid Waste District from that agreement. So um, we definitely uh, will start planning ahead as to what uh, will happen um, when that agreement ends, if we can negotiate a new agreement or how we can fill that funding gap. Um, another consideration is that uh, Rumpke is opening a new um, recyclables and waste processing facility on the south side. Uh, probably set to open in March of um, 2023. So uh, that'll change the game as far as uh, waste processing as well. Um, and finally, uh, we're considering a name change. Uh, currently, the district is called the Monroe County Solid Waste Management District, which is a mouthful and doesn't uh, really pinpoint what, um, what our goals are. Uh, we recently adopted a new five-year plan and focused in on waste reduction. So we're thinking of changing the name to the waste reduction, Monroe County Waste Reduction uh, District. So uh, that'll be on the agenda in December. So that's my report for tonight. Thank you. Councilmember Rosenbarger. No report, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Flaherty. Thank you. Um, just a brief report to note that my regular monthly constituent meetings on third Monday of the month uh, will we'll next be held on um, this coming Monday, November 21st at 5.30 p.m. You can access a link to a uh, Zoom uh, meeting for that on the council's website, bloomington.in.gov slash council. There's both a calendar link as well as a, a link of upcoming meetings on the, on the right side uh, bar. Uh, so that's all for me, thanks. Thank you, Council Member Rollo. Thank you, I like, likewise would like to announce uh, Council President Sandberg and my cons monthly constituent meeting on Saturday, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. And you can find the link, as my colleague has just described, at bloomington.in.gov forward slash council. And you may find the Zoom link by following that link. Thank you. Thank you. No report from me, so we will now move to the mayor and city offices reports. And first up, we will be hearing from Mr. John Zodi, our hand director. Good evening, President. Good evening, council members. <clears throat> um, apologize if I do a little coughing tonight. I'm getting over some lingering cough. I think a lot of folks are out there battling that. So I do feel fine, but I'm just got a cough. So I um, ask you to bear with me. <clears throat> well, uh, as um, 
All of you know, uh, on an annual basis, the <clears throat> Department of Housing and Neighborhood Development for the city uh, reports on, um, ostensibly for this purpose, the Housing uh, Development Fund. Um, but in that scope, we like to talk about the latest with housing coming off of budget hearings uh, in August and that process uh, where we are before the end of the year. So this re uh, report to you tonight <clears throat> will um, contain information about where we are with uh, different projects and things uh, in the hand department across the city. And let me start by thanking all the partners in housing, uh, the hand department staff, uh, as well as the um, affordable housing team, as we call it here at the city, with the different departments that are involved, uh, the council for your approval of, of uh, different projects uh, over the years, as well as our community partners. Mary Morgan from Heading Home of, of South Central Indiana is here with us tonight uh, and to show support. Uh, and so appreciate all of our partners in the community that work toward the provision of affordable housing. It is certainly a community effort, and I'm thankful for their uh, uh, support and uh, efforts uh, to advance that goal. So, uh, so giving you a housing report tonight. Uh, we can go ahead to the next slide there, uh, and I have a clicker. So let me advance that. There we go. All right, so to take a step back to where we were, uh, I reported these numbers uh, during the budget process. There's been a couple updates. Uh, for all of you before the end of the year. So since 2016, the uh, city has engaged in uh, community and development, uh, engaged community development partners to tackle affordable housing. So uh, you'll see the 1,121 um, units that uh, are, are affordable during the budget process. I gave council sort of a breakdown of where those were. You'll see more on that in just a minute. With a total of 1,647 bedrooms. In the recent weeks, just a few weeks ago, the council approved a pilot, a payment in lieu of taxes for Country View Apartments for the pre preservation of 206 units, 408 bedrooms of affordable housing uh, on the southwest side of the city. We also have two projects in the approval pipeline that have been approved. Uh, one will uh, go before the BZA, the Board of Zoning Appeals tomorrow night for uh, 28 units, one unit, one project is 16 units, another one is 12 units. Those have gone through the approval process and are reaching their final stages uh, here in, in, in Bloomington, so we're working with them, and I'll go through that a little bit later uh, as well. So we have some new, um, new units uh, coming online here as we approach the end of the year. Um, the efforts also include the updates of the Unified Development Ordinance, ordinance and the changes uh, with our incentives and how that can incentivize uh, workforce housing, uh, of course the Housing Development Fund, and of course ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act, and ED LIT funds that the council approved uh, earlier this spring um, and the administration proposed. So just to give you a sort of a visual here, um, location of affordable units, when you look at those 1,121 units, uh, sort of gives you a, a uh, scatter map, if you will, uh, around town. Uh, these are laid out across the city, so pretty good distribution. Uh, we have some, of course, that are uh, in existence, others that are under construction or approved, and so uh, this gives you uh, an idea just of what, where they are, what the distribution is. It's important that that housing, uh, mixed uh, use housing, uh, mixed income housing be, uh, be just that, that all the affordable housing is in one place or another, that there is a good distribution of that across the city, and I think this map does show that. In addition, uh, we have the affordability breakdown. So when you look at those income bands, what are the units, what sort of income bands as we call them, which are the, you know, the percentages uh, by 10, uh, what sort of income are the folks living in those uh, units uh, making? And so this shows you uh, quite a bit in the 60% uh, area median income. If you are uh, one of the big projects that incentivizes affordable housing is the low income housing tax credit project. And to be, um, uh, to qualify for that, the residents are 60% AMI or below. And so we have quite a few over the years of those, uh, those projects. And so you see uh, quite a bit of that in the 60% AMI range, but you'll see a visual distribution there uh, of across the other income bands. And you see a 80 to 120% as a reminder is what we consider to be sort of the workforce housing range. So we do have about 30% in that, in that category, which is important to, to point out. So what are our focus areas? Taking a step back again, uh, we talk about sort of three buckets, if you will, housing security. How are we assisting those most at risk of housing insecurity? Uh, Mary uh, is a big leader in that. Rental housing, how are we increasing the, avail the availability of affordable rental housing? 
and home ownership, how are we increasing the opportunity to own and stay in a home? And I'll get to that in just a minute because it's a really important uh, effort uh, by the city. So uh, uh, for housing security, uh, heading home of South Central Indiana, you received a report from, from uh, Mary and the ha uh, heading home group on September 21st. This is an effort, uh, the partnership of the Community Foundation of Bloomington and Monroe County, as well as the United Way. Uh, and uh, the city and the county uh, have provided um, almost $5 million of American Rescue Plan Act funds for this effort, which all of you know, but it's an important reminder. Um, in my third bullet point, I'll talk about why that's important. Uh, our community uh, is, is uh, making strides here, and we're the first uh, community, first city in the state of Indiana to uh, be uh, joined Built for Zero, which Mary described to you back in September. But this effort underway is very, very significant. And when we look at what else the city is doing with other funds, like the Community Development Block Grant and Jack Hopkins funding, we're awarding, uh, just for, for the year 2022, we awarded $1.26 million to local agencies to do their, their social service, public services work uh, to support our great nonprofit community here, which does a lot of things. When we're talking about in housing security or insecurity, the, the provision of food service, child care, uh, all of the things that we do, uh, mediation services, all the things that, uh, that uh, contribute to uh, a person's life uh, and lead to security or insecurity are really important to mention when we talk about the issue of housing security. And so there's a lot that we do outside of direct housing dollars that contribute to uh, providing housing security. And then home ARPA funds, so Home American Rescue Plan Act dollars, this is a different allocation of ARPA money that came to... Um, local jurisdictions in 2021. The city uh, got $2,045,000 of home ARPA money. Home is the Home Investment Partnerships uh, Program through HUD. Uh, hand administers our regular, we get a regular allocation of home dollars each year. This can help for to construction of new affordable housing. It does rehabs, down payment cl closing costs. Um, the, the HUD department and Treasury uh, allocated through the home program an additional ARPA allocation. So we received a little over $2 million for that. The state of Indiana received about $54 million that uh, is, has been granted out outside of what are known as entitlement communities. So Bloomington is an entitlement community due to our population. We are entitled to receive money directly from the federal government from HUD. And so this program through home is a different allocation of ARPA, uh, and by March 31st of next year, we have an allocation plan that we need to submit to uh, Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, and so we'll be talking a lot more about that, uh, but it's a really important uh, program that we'll be doing a lot of outreach on to those who provide services to the unhoused and in the social services community here in Bloomington, so uh, we'll, we'll actually end on that note. Rental housing. Always important to state, and I hope I start to sound like a broken record with this, with our rental housing program. This is about equity. No matter what rent you pay in the city of Bloomington, uh, you are entitled to a safe place to live, a safe rental house, rental unit, rental apartment, whatever you call it, regardless of the rent you pay. Uh, if you're in a registered rental, it is subject to inspection every three, four, or five years, or based on a complaint basis if the tenant has an issue. And so this is a really important piece of what the department uh, does in hand. We are on track for uh, uh, providing 1,450 cycle inspections, cycle being a permit is expiring or has expired, and we are going out to inspect that to uh, consider renewal of the permit. So that's what a cycle inspection is. Uh, we manage through the registration, rental registration program, about 28,000 units across the city with more coming online uh, just about every day. And one of our big efforts right now, sort of behind the scenes, is we're implementing a new software system, the InterGov EPL software system that a lot of different departments are doing here in the city that's also happening in hand. And we are moving to digitize um, our 11,000 uh, rental files. So a big part of our square footage in the office is a file room. And so we are moving to digitize all that. So a lot of change in the office uh, with the rental inspection program. The staff is working really hard and being very patient, and we appreciate that. Uh, we have our B-Town Neighboring Project, which when we look at student rentals, uh, student renters in our core neighborhoods especially, how do we get uh, student renters and neighbors to um, 
get to know one another, to live in harmony and cohesion. Um, and so we're really excited about this project. We kicked it off uh, with a block party in Elm Heights in August. Uh, Councilmember Volan stopped by. Um, and so we are moving. We did some canvassing in Green Acres uh, in October. So we're moving. We've got a student group at IU that we're working with to sort of share information and get uh, the word out in, in our neighborhoods about uh, when students live there and how do you sort of coexist and make sure everybody's uh, working together. Uh, the BHA, Bloomington Housing Authority Landlord Risk Mitigation Fund, something that's getting a lot more uh, discussion going, but this, how do we make someone who might be considered an at-risk or a risky tenant, if you will, how do we make that opportunity and availability for rental housing easier for them and for the, the, lease, the lessor, the landlord or the property manager? And so the housing authority through ARPA funding provided by the city um, is tackling this issue in the city. So creating basically an insurance risk pool so that um, we can say to a, a landlord, uh, we understand this tenant may have an eviction, may have another issue on record. Um, here's, here's some backup. Uh, money. Here's an insurance policy, if you will, uh, to help this person get housed. And then if something were to um, exceed the deposit or cause damage, something like that, it gives the, the property manager or the landlord a little more reassurance that, um, that uh, housing, what would otherwise be considered a risky tenant, may be a little more um, possible. And we think that's a very big deal. Uh, with the uh, vacancy, or I should say the occupancy rate of our housing in Bloomington, a rental housing is at about 98%. So it's not, it's not available uh, in great sums. And so doing everything we can to make sure people are housed and quickly is important. We have our Fair Housing Resources, uh, the uh, Human Rights Commission, Barbara McKinney, and the legal departments are a big uh, advocate there. And then we also have a monitoring program, so we've uh, sort of formalized that this year in the department to monitor the affordable housing, starting with those 1,100 uh, units that I've been talking to you about. Uh, how do we make sure that they are actually in compliance and in leasing to people of those incomes? And we've got a good return so far this year on, on that. So we're excited about all the activity with, with rental housing. On the home ownership side, um, preserving ownership. And this is where our rehabs come in. We've got about 20 to 25 rehabs in the pipeline. So uh, through our HUD funding, through community development block grant dollars, and through uh, the Home Investment Partnership Program, we have rehabs. Emergency home rehabs, furnace goes out, need a new roof. Owner-occupied rehabs, which can be more, a little more involved. There's more money available for that. Uh, home modification for accessible living, if someone needs to have a ramp built. All these are income qualified. But this is about keeping people in their homes in an owner-occupied uh, structure. And this is a really important. We have all the existing housing stock in Bloomington. How do we keep people in their homes who are owners? Um, and then how do we create ownership? So purchase assistance, shared appreciation program through the city. We offer 20% um, down payment help up to what is now going to be the median sales price of a home. It used to be up to 50000 but with the median sales price going up, it's around... $300,000, we can raise that cap a little bit. Down payment closing cost assistance through our federal money and also through the city. So we've helped um, a good handful of folks with that. We want to increase that program through, uh, by st through starters, uh, partnerships with the realtors and the lender community. We have a new program manager coming on in the department next year um, who I plan to have really tackle that and focus on it. We've got a really good intake strategy and processing, but we need more outreach and get the word out on this because when people know about it and they understand it, they like it, and it's really important for first-time home buyers and giving them those incentives to, to get a, a house. We've got our Hope Will project and vacant lots. We purchased some lots over on West Dodd Street earlier this year, um, and then the Arlington Park Drive uh, development, which is a picture of the lots that you see uh, there on this slide, as well as the Community Land Trust. Uh, through the Bloomington Housing Authority and the Summit Hill Community Development Corporation. So Housing Development Fund, sort of originally why we're here tonight. Just as a reminder, the Housing Development Fund uh, provides uh, solutions for both uh, affordable rental and ownership housing, promoting long-term affordability for those at 120% or less of area median income. So AMI, area median income, is an important, uh, important term uh, that we use. 
It's created in 2017 uh, by the council's ordinance 1703. And it's revenue sources, uh, developer contributions, community foundation, uh, has through the housing trust fund, an original sort of endowment there, interest income, loan repayments, and recover forward funds that came about during the pandemic. So just a summary, number summary. Um, we didn't appropriate housing development funds during the budget process in 2022 because we have ARPA money that we are using and a lot of that can be spent on affordable housing. So uh, as you uh, read on the agenda, uh, you'll be considering an appropriation for the end of the year for the housing development fund uh, that we will uh, are asking for. But we did spend some ARPA money this year that we would have otherwise would have been spent out of the housing development fund and also use some department money for that um, that we had through some reorganization uh, possibilities. So uh, 194,000 out of that uh, would have otherwise, if we didn't have ARPA, uh, basically that would have been spent out of the housing development fund. The total spent from the fund in the last uh, seven, uh, six years, I should say, uh, $883,875. Total revenue, 3.8 million, almost 3.9 to 4 million there uh, with a total unit affordable units created of 267. The investment per unit, so when you take that, um, that spent uh, divided by the units, that's $3,310 a unit. Typically, and you may remember this from when you consider tax abatements and other things, our, our range, our sort of subsidy range that we look at is somewhere between twelve dollars and $20,000 if we're providing a grant or a loan out of the housing development fund, we'll say, well, what's the per unit we're getting out of this, what's the incentive or the per unit range. And so this is well below uh, what we um, normally would grant out. And so I think it's a pretty good return uh, where we are on, on this. You've appropriated $2.1 million for the Housing Development Fund for the 2023 budget cycle. Um, and then a $500,000 request is pending for the appropriation at the end of the year along with the others that President Sandberg read. Anticipated revenue, $480,000. This is through payments in lieu, not of taxes, but payments in lieu through the Unified Development Ordinance. So if a developer is coming in and using incentives for, um, for affordability or, or sustainability, they can do a payment in lieu. So they're not gonna do those units in their development, but instead they're gonna uh, make a, a payment to the Housing Development Fund, and that's what this is. We have two projects that that is, uh, that is coming up on. And then uh, our program intention for the, some of the ED lit money is to uh, make that revenue for the housing development fund. It's important to grow the fund as we have projects like Hopewell coming online. We have the Arlington Park uh, development. Uh, mentioned this during, during budget hearings, but I'll say it again, is that growing the fund and having additional possibilities with that is really important. We did have one idea, for instance, is there a possibility of a revolving loan fund out of there, and to do that, you've got to have a lot of capital in there. So, increasing the amount of it is important. Not to be, uh, not to just sit there, but to be used on projects as we see so much more coming online here in the city. Uh, some some uh, updates on funding with ARPA. Uh, we had 3.5 million um, or, uh, appropriated for 2022. We may come back for some of that next year. Uh, this is. Uh, uh, made contributions and uh, efforts toward the housing security efforts, uh, heading home of South, of South Central Indiana. Um, we bought property uh, on the vacant lots. We have uh, contributed to the development of the Community Land Trust at uh, Summit Hill Community Development Corporation, uh, contributed to the Landlord Risk Mitigation Fund efforts, and hand programming as well. We're going to be doing some uh, marketing to get our programs, the word out on our programs a little more via social media and and written materials, so we're going to be spending ARPA money on that. ED Lit, um, as a reminder from the budget, uh, that will help pay for our new program manager. We'll go into the Housing Development Fund uh, and our Shared Appreciation Program to grow that as well. And then HUD, our, our HUD funding, our annual allocation uh, from the federal government. There's a, a tilde in there because we never know exactly what we're going to get until we get the notification, but it's usually around a million dollars between CDBG and home, and this includes our rehab programming, community assistance through social services, and our physical improvement projects through CDBG as well. And I know a couple council members will be uh, joining efforts on that here in the next month or so. Major project updates. We're really excited about Hopewell, um, but we've got to keep getting the word out about the Hopewell project, formerly the IU Health Bloomington Hospital site. We are engaging the development community, the development community uh, on an ongoing basis. We're probably having uh, 
three to four conversations a week with people in the development community to gauge interest and share information about the program and see what feedback they have. And we're gathering all of that for when we are ready to do requests for information for proposals. So get those formalized ideas in for how the site wants to be developed. And I know the council, uh, the zoning overlay is a big piece of that uh, that we're um, working on as well. So um, infrastructure will start on the phase one east portion. This is the block between Kroger and the old hospital. So that block where uh, a lot of IU Health facilities were and the New Hope for Families houses along West 2nd, that block is now demolished and we'll start infrastructure there in uh, 2023. We also anticipate submitting a LIHTC low income housing tax credit application for the core building project um, next July. That's when those are due. And so we are uh, moving forward on that. We also applied for a ready grant uh, for infrastructure. So. Uh, Jackson Street um, is a um, corridor that would basically go right behind the core building through that section of the of the project and so we applied for uh, nearly two million dollars in ready funding um, for the construction of the piece of Jackson Street that would go from First Street up to University which is that new Greenway Street through the project and so uh, we have applied for that um, hopeful there uh, to help with that construction, and that will come right off of West First Street, which is going to be reconstructed as well through federal and state funding. So we're excited about the infrastructure there. We've got a lot more infrastructure to fund, uh, but we are uh, excited about what's what's there so far. And then the new new development on Arlington Park Drive. Um, many would recognize this from I-69. You see the multifamily units. Uh, so just as a reminder, the um, developer, as a part of this planned unit development, uh, agreed to grant the city 45 lots. Uh, there's R4 zoning up there. Um, and we would like to see at least 50% of those be permanently affordable. And so we are working with the Summit Hill Community Development Corporation to uh, make this a land trust opportunity. And so lots will not all be held by the land trust. We want a good mix. So in order to um, generate revenue and to get that going, uh, some lots will be sold at market rate and some people may come and build a house or a developer. We've engaged Clear Creek Homes and Habitat for Humanity here in Monroe County to uh, be the primary developers um, of that lot through uh, Summit Hill uh, Community Development Corporation, which again is the community land trust that's forming. Um, and so those agreements are underway and the lots are um, still uh, getting some utility stuff finished up, but they are getting ready to go. And so we're real excited about this opportunity because it pushes the idea of home ownership. We want to see ownership here. Uh, next to a lot of rental, but through the city's efforts and that of the land trust, uh, we'll see some new home ownership up here, which is really exciting. So what guides us? I've had this slide last year, and I think it's just important to kind of uh, center us uh, all the time. What, do we, what informs us? The comprehensive plan for the city, our 2020 housing study, affordability data uh, through HUD that's updated every year, our economic supply chain and property availability, what's out there, what can we tackle, what do we need to focus on, our proactive communication with community and potential development partners. Um, so as we're doing with Hopewell, uh, what are we gonna do with the lots on West Dodds? That's an opportunity for us for a, on a smaller scale, but how do we get out there and make sure that we're pushing the ball forward and we're not just reacting, we're, we have a lot of interest I do want to say that there, you know, talked to a developer yesterday about a parcel I didn't even know existed, quite frankly, and said, oh, okay, great. And, you know, some other people knew about it, but I'm fairly new. And I said, awesome, let's keep talking. They want to build some, uh, they're interested in housing. There's, there's a lot of interest to build and live in Bloomington. We just got to make it happen. And so that reaction as well as the proactive activity to, to get housing going is really important. And the tools. Uh, so we've got our affordable housing team. We've got council members, our boards and commissions, our financial programs and our incentives, and of course, um, the city-led or owned projects like Hopewell or the Arlington Park Drive are big opportunities for the city. Uh, they have to be done right, and they're gonna take time. They are taking time, but we feel good about uh, where we are with those. So, I'll take questions. I do wanna leave and leave this slide up during questions if there are any about home ARPA funds. If you um, have input, you're curious about what it is, um, this largely is going to be funds used to serve those in need who are at risk of homelessness or populations um, that have been at risk of homelessness, of homelessness and, and funds used to help that. So 
Like I said at the beginning, we are doing a lot to tackle that now with ARPA money. This is a different kind of ARPA money, and uh, we want to have a good allocation plan for that uh, submitted to uh, the Housing and Urban Development Department by March. And so we're happy to hear input from the community or anyone else here tonight. Uh, just email us at hand at bloomington.in.gov. So I want to have that be a good effort. So with that, I'll uh, stop and take questions. I appreciate uh, your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Zodi, for that very comprehensive report. Uh, I will just ask, I would assume this, this slide deck will be available to council members, or has it yes, already it been? Yes, it sent out as an addendum today. Um, I will ask the staff maybe to send out the, I tweaked it a little bit at the end of the day, but absolutely, we'll, we'll get it out to you. Very good. Thank you. Any questions for Council Member Bolin? Yeah, just one. Thanks for the report, by the way. It's very comprehensive, as uh, Madam President said. Um, you cited a statistic, you know, we've talked about um, establishing a definitive report on the number of housing units in Bloomington, yep. and I called that number up, but the, you cited a number tonight saying that rental occupancy is currently 98%. How did you derive that number? There's a market report that we get annually, um, which I think had it around 97 or 98, so that was, that was the market report that I received from um, the uh, realtors. Um, and so that's where I got the statistic. So the Bloomington Board of Realtors? Yes. Um, i trying to think of that. That might have been the Apartment Association, actually, council member. Um, and then anecdotally, when you talk to um, landlords and property managers, they'll tell you it's actually uh, very, Higher. very close to 100% occupancy. There's turnover of units. And one realtor told me, you know, I, it's virtually 100% because, you know, when you see any vacancy there, it's we're turning over units and things like that. But People are leased up through next year. It's it's, it's pretty tight. Yeah. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, I wanted to um, ask about the ED Lit funds. Mm -hmm. So, um, on one of your slides, you had the Housing Development Fund summary slide, <laughs> and at the bottom, it said ED Lit anticipated revenue mm -hmm. to the Housing Development Fund is four hundred fifty thousand dollars. Is that for twenty twenty three? Yes, that's just for 2023. It's just that's what's appropriated for ED Lit to um, our housing efforts, I should say. So the idea there is to have 200,000 sort of uh, with a focus on rental, with 250,000 with a focus on ownership. And then I'm, I'm just trying to understand then the next page you have funding updates, um, ED Lit for 2023, um, $1,046,000. Mm -hmm. So is that outside of the Housing Development Fund or including housing development and other things? Is that, that how you get to $450,000. So the $1,046,000 um, in the, I'm just pulling it up here as well. The $1,046,000 uh, for the ED Lit funds that was appropriated in the budget process for 2023 includes the 450,000 that would go into the housing development fund as well as uh, helping pay for the new program manager and other activities that I talked about. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Member Sims. Uh, thank you, Director Zoli, for your report. Um, I just have one question. This has to do with the revolving loan fund. Um, and I'm not so sure I really understand that. I mean, I understand the concept, but where are those funds held and what revenue stream is used to build that up? And lastly, mm -hmm. where does the CDFI fit in there, if at all, sure. in, in that process? To answer your first question, the revolving loan fund doesn't exist yet. That's just an idea when we talk about how to use the housing development fund in different ways. Um, we actually had a developer suggest this to us. When we're looking at larger scale development, can we loan money out to build certain number of houses, then when those sell, that money goes back in and it just, we keep, we keep lending out of that so you can keep the development going and you're generating cash flow and revenue, uh, which you need you know, a pretty significant amount in there to do that. It was one of the discussions we had on the Arlington Park Drive. So it doesn't exist right now, it's just when we look at creative ways to use the housing development funds, that would be one. Um, the, is, that, is that intended for home ownership mainly? Or multifamily? Uh, or, or that idea was focused on, on ownership. So this, okay, is, was, this was couched to us in, a, in the context of single family home development. Yes. So it okay. uh, doesn't mean it's exclusively for that, um, but uh, in this context, <laughs> it, it was. Um, and council member, I'm gonna have to just ask you to repeat the second question, I apologize. I think I was asking about the CDFI. The, yeah, you're where, right. Where uh, it fits in at yeah. all. 
So uh, CDFI Friendly Bloomington is a great connector. Um, one of the projects, uh, they've helped Bloomington Cooperative Living quite a bit, for instance, uh, secure funding and loans for their projects, and so we have worked with them on that. Um, uh, Brian Payne, who many of you may know, is our CDFI Friendly Bloomington lead, and so he, um, I think the best way I'd sort of describe that organization is a good connector. How do, they, how, does, how, do, how do they get, how do projects, housing projects specifically get connected with larger financing, and uh, that's what CDFI Friendly Bloomington does. So they are with the Bloomington Cooperative Living Project, um, and those in the past, they are helping secure loans for that, and then we work with them, and I talk to Brian about one project specifically, and just um, talk about how the city might help out as well, but they help sort of pull financing for that stuff. So they play a role for sure. And when you say connectors, that means CDFI works with other banking institutions where the clients we're trying to help otherwise wouldn't be eligible. Is that the connecting part we're talking about? Or yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think that sums it up is my understanding. I'm not uh, an expert in CDFI workings, but yes, I think that, that, that sums it up pretty well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Scamblori. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the presentation and especially for the slides too. Um, what's really striking to me is the range of tools we have in this toolkit. Um, it, everything from the income qualified rehab program to purchase assistance to the landlord mitigation fund and so forth. I guess I'm curious about what we've been learning about these different tools and which ones provide us with the most return on the investment. And I'm I'm guessing that could be get some recommendations eventually about which ones might get expanded or which ones wouldn't. Could you comment on that and could you share your impressions of what you've seen so far? Sure. Well, I'll say first that um, we are very grateful for our federal funding, but it does come with a lot of regulation, right? And so the administration of federal money is quite intensive, both for us as a city as well as for our sub-recipients, the people to whom we grant the funds through the Citizen Advisory Commission process and through the home, the home program um, particularly uh, has a lot of uh, regulation with it. Our local incentives um, that we do, the Housing Development Fund, the um, incentives through the UDO, Unified Development Ordinance, are, are, are a little more flexible. They also can go higher on income. So I think what we've learned is um, when you look at the different types of development for affordable housing that you do, there are lots of programs out there for 80% and below, uh, which is awesome because you've got HUD and so you've got HUD money, federal money, you've got uh, low-income housing tax credits, you've got rental housing tax credits, you've got a lot of stuff out there for 80 and below, which serves a huge need. But as you look at Bloomington being a higher-priced housing market, You've got people coming in, working at IU, working at Catalan. Workforce housing is a really important thing. And there's not much out there structured incentives for workforce housing. And the city's been able to um, do three things I'll mention again, which is the UDO incentives. You can get uh, incentives if you go up to you know, 120% of that band of income. Our shared appreciation home ownership program goes up to 120% of AMI, area median income. And... Um, our housing development fund can can help with 120 percent and below and so being able to create our own incentives that's been great i think that is a great uh sort of marketing tool if you will when we're talking to the development community and they wonder because uh, construction costs are up we're seeing interest rates go up what is out there to make all of this easier particularly in the production of affordable housing and we need to help incentivize and so we have our own incentives that we're able to talk about, which I get really excited about because it just is one more opportunity it gives them to, to help, uh, help get something going uh, when we can do that above the 80%. I never want to understate the importance of those federal incentives and the tax credit projects that make it possible for people of 30% area median income, 40%, 50%, which can cause, I mean, great housing insecurity. It is difficult to find a place to live at those income ranges. We can never underestimate, understate the importance of those. But when we see costs go up and housing prices go up, we've got to think about what are we doing for those people who are, who are working in jobs that may be, you know, for a family of four, area median income in Bloomington this year is $91,400. So what do we do for those families that are working or coming to town or 
being added at Catalunt. Uh, we hear from IU about adding staff and faculty. We gotta find a, something that works for everybody and I think what I've learned is being able to create those incentives is huge. I follow up with one more question. Um, thank you for that. And, and one of, one particular tool I've always been interested in is the landlord risk mitigation fund, mm -hmm. um, because of the way the unique way in which that responds to challenges that are not necessarily financial, yeah. per se. Um, what have you seen on that this year? How much of that have we expended? Who has been helped? Yeah. Um, uh, what can you share? It hasn't formally kicked off yet. I'll say it's uh, we've had we the process we'd hope to get uh, staff are on board sooner and so we set up that we had an agreement with the housing authority um, to put it in place and then there the next charge was to hire someone to administer it and run it um, hit a couple hurdles there uh, had a couple applicants and then the had to go back to the drawing board uh, but they've got a person on board who's great uh, she comes from rapid rehousing uh, that re so she knows uh, the rental community she knows tenants and so we're really excited about the opportunity there. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that they are working to see how that mission can be expanded outside of city, lim outside of city limits. Our money needs to be spent inside the city limits. And so they're mm -hmm. working on other ways to see how they can help Monroe County because the housing authority's scope is Monroe County, not just the city of Bloomington. And so um, I think it's a great, it's a, to me it's a very innovative way to say how do we, we, we've got to get people housed. I mean, the, the, the overriding thing here, I, my last slide said, what drives us? It's residents in need. I got an email right before I came in here from somebody that said, uh, I need housing for my mom, my cat, and me. That's all the email said. So, okay, what is my response going to be? You know, we're working on a rehab that's pretty difficult, and that resident needed a lot of help. It's, I mean, this is real-time people need housing, right? So you're always kind of, you know, that's always kind of riding over, uh, over your head. And so when you look at what makes it hard for people to stay in their home or to get a place to live, um, something like the landlord, landlord Risk Mitigation Fund can, I hope, and we all hope, uh, that it can provide incentive to get individuals housed who might otherwise have trouble uh, doing so. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Council Member Rollo. Thank you, Director Zodi, for your presentation. I wanted to follow up on Councilmember Volin's question about rental housing occupancy of large downtown apartment buildings. Um, so you you essentially get a report from the Board of Realtors that's self-reported from the the real estate companies that that manage those buildings. Is that correct? Yeah, and actually, uh, Council Member, I do really think that's the Apartment Association that provided that market update. So apartment Association. Yeah, I need to correct myself there. We okay. get a different market update from the realtors. All right. and But you don't take any steps to validate that. You just... I'm, I'm you, sorry, what was that? To validate those numbers. You, you, your department doesn't do that. Um, is it possible... I mean, do those numbers jibe with when you do a rec rental occupancy permit for those dwellings, d um, which may occur every three or four or five years, but do those numbers um, seem to validate the, the reported occupancy? I would say yes, and I'm gonna tell you that I don't have a, a technical conclusion to your question, meaning that there isn't a way we sort of validate that market report. Uh, we have uh, we have r rarely is there vacancy when we do inspections if a unit's registered. It's, I mean, by and large has a tenant in it. Um, there are houses that are not registered who have people living in them, which is a whole separate problem. Um, we have a close partnership with the apartment association who tells us to the person, we're leased up through next fall, we're leased up through next spring. It's, there's never, a, we have a bunch of vacancy, do you know anybody who's looking? When we were faced with a complex uh, that was being torn down on the north side of town, we, and those tenants are gonna be displaced, um, we gathered uh, a listing of apartments in town, the very best we could. Um, and I wanna make a note about housing navigation uh, here as well, but um, we gathered a list, you know, who takes pets, that kind of stuff, because we wanted to be, have some sort of resource for, for tenants and there was very little vacancy in there that we found. So I'm comfortable with what I see on our side. 
what I hear from those in the community. I go to the apartment association lunch every month. I talk to them on a regular basis. There's never, there's never a call for, we need tenants. Um, so I feel pretty comfortable with that occupancy because we get people, again, going back to my other comment, we get people who call the office and say, I need a place to live, you know, and how do we find them? We helped place, you know, someone, we have a small rental deposit program that we helped someone there and getting them placed was important. So it's, um, there's, there's, there's no uh, vast quantity of vacancy out there and I feel pretty comfortable with that number. Okay, when you do the rental occupancy inspection, mm -hmm. do you take note of whether there is there are people living in that unit? Oh yes, absolutely. Okay. All right, so you have that data. Yeah. All right. And Thank so, uh, and back to my housing navigation question, I do want to say that uh, that Heading Home of South, South Central Indiana is working on a housing navigation tool that helps this. Right. What's going to probably never going to be perfect, but helping people. I need a house. Okay, where do you go? What do you do? We have helping Bloomington Monroe other resources, but is there, a, is there a way we can do that better? And so uh, that group is working on that effort. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Smith. Oh, thank you. Um, thanks for the report, Mr. Zodi. You're doing a lot of great work in, uh, in the hand department, and hand department's always been doing great work, so I appreciate it. Um, how does our, compare, our affordability unit percentage compare with other comparable cities. I mean, it looks to me like the, some of the numbers you showed, um, 10,000 bedrooms and about 1,600 of them are affordable. That's about 16%. Does, is there a, 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 some kind of way for us to understand, is, are we doing okay in Bloomington? Are we not doing okay? Are we way off the average? Um, I'm trying to th figure out how to think about this. You know, I think it's a great question, Councilmember. I don't have a sort of where are we, you know, what a percentage are we compared to West Lafayette, for instance. I think the different dynamics that impact a community are so vast that I'm not sure you would get a good uh, comparison, but I'm going to ask the question uh, when I go back because I think it's a valid question to, to answer. Uh, Bloomington continues to be in the top five uh, most expensive places to live if you're a renter. Uh, we have, uh, you know, 65% of our residents are renters, being a large college town, a moderately sized city. Um, so it's, you know, there's a lot of, I don't want to call them apples and oranges out there, but there's a lot of different factors that kind of play into that. Um, I'm never going to say the box is checked that we've got enough affordable housing. I'm just not going to do it. I don't, you know, we've got too much need out there. Um, but I, there was a high, really high level of activity. And I, let me end with this about the Hopewell project. It's so rare that a city has the opportunity to redevelop 21 acres right in the middle of their yeah. city. And so that opportunity is a huge uh, uh, expenditure of time uh, and funds, of course, from the city, but um, well worth it because we're talking about upwards of 1,000 units of new housing, not all affordable, but new units of housing, which will help uh, distribute you know, more, uh, hopefully kind of lower the cost and impact the market when you have that much more additional housing, what does that do to the demand, of course. So, but your question, your original question is a very good one. I'm gonna see what else I can find out. Thank you very much, and I do really appreciate all you're doing. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, any other questions? Madam President. Yes. Just a procedural matter, which is that I think we've well exceeded our um, time allotted for, for reports from the mayor and city offices and seeing how we still have a report from Clerk Bolden, I wanted to move that we extend the time for reports from the mayor and city offices for another 10 minutes. Moved and seconded. Do we need to, all in favor say aye on that? Aye. 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 This is important information. I'm happy to continue it. Council Member Volan. Um, to follow up on Council Member Borella's question, which went down an interesting path, um, uh, how you're in the process of digitizing uh, the records in the department of all those cycle rental inspections. Um, and is there a notation on there that will get put into a database that simply says, the unit was occupied at the time of inspection? Yeah, there, there's a process that we go through that says I it's mean, occupied. would it be relatively easy to search for the number of unoccupied units upon inspection? Because that would be a simple way of determining, uh, it was another data point for determining mm -hmm. occupancy. Yeah, uh, yes, I think there is. We are transitioning software systems, as I know, so I can 
Uh, I can <laughs> work on that for you, uh, but that transition may make it a little cloudy, but we can, we can see what we can find. I think it would go hand in hand with, pardon the pun, the, with the, the report of housing units if we could actually know uh, just, I mean, there's a hard data point that I think Councilman Rallo would also appreciate, among others, uh, that uh, the city is simply reporting that upon inspection, the unit was occupied. Uh, the number of units that will be unoccupied will be very low, should be easy to find. Yep. So I'm hoping that, you know, we can do that. And I look forward, to, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to set up a meeting with you to talk about this data gathering. So thank I'm you. I'm sorry, what was that last part, council member? I, I'm, I got an email to you to set up a meeting to talk about gathering this data. The housing units, okay, great. Yeah, thanks yep. very much. Yep. Thank you, any other questions? All right, thanks again so much. Right. Very good information. We appreciate Hand and, and your leadership. Thank you. Thanks. All right, and next we will hear from Clerk Bolin. Good evening. Evening. All right. Let's see if we've got this going. My name is Clerk Nicole Bolden, and for those of you who may be visually impaired, I am a brown skinned black woman wearing a black jacket and gray sweater. And uh, let's get going. I'm going to keep my presentation a little on the short side since we're running a little long this evening. But I wanted to talk to the council about the AIM IDEA Summit, which I attended two weeks ago, and um, thought I'd give you a little information. So AIM stands for Accelerate Indiana Municipalities, which was formerly known as the Indiana Association of Cities and Towns. I have the privilege of serving on the board of directors. I am the chair of the Administration Policy Committee and I'm also a member of the Amicus Review Committee, so I tend to go to the AIM IDEA Summit every year, um, along with the Board of Directors meetings. So this year, the summit included over 100 exhibitors and organizations and state agencies that all specialized in municipal government. So there were a mix of speakers and over 30 workshops and networking opportunities that were scheduled over about three days. So that was why you didn't see me at our last regular session, but I was at the workshops and I thought it would be nice to come and talk to you about a few of the workshops so that you had a chance to just see a very, very brief overview. I will not talk to you about every class, what everybody talked about, but I thought I'd show you a couple of them. So, one of the classes was bringing broadband into the 21st century. I think we've heard our administration talk about that a little bit. And a lot of the workshops don't just serve as informational sessions, but they also serve to satisfy requirements for people who are seeking other certifications like their management, institu municipal management institution credits or their continuing legal education credits. So you will frequently see um, attorneys for cities and towns who are attending those. Larry Allen, who works on our legal department, was at the um, IDEA Summit this year. Um, Director Zodi was there. I actually sat next to him in a couple of our classes. Over past years, Mayor Hamilton has been there. I believe one of your council colleagues has attended, which I just found out a couple of minutes ago, so I can't pretend I knew that. Um, but you do see mayors from all over the state attend, you see council members from all over the state attend, and attorneys from all over the state attend on a regular basis. We've been talking about housing. This was one of the sessions that was offered this year, um, talking about housing markets from all over the state. So it is really, there are a lot of wonderful classes that are offered. Um, this year, one of the classes that was offered was talking about strengthening community through arts and creativity, and it was taught or presented by Maya Michelson, and I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with that name since Maya Michelson was our arts director for many years. Um, one of the courses that was presented was, you know, knowing the roles and responsibilities of the planning commission, the BZA, and the legislative body. So, and I'm gonna pause here just for a second and mention that every time we do one of these big summits, the AIM does a really great job of following up with 
making sure all the materials are sent to the participants. So after you're done, you get all of the slideshows and all the decks. I did not take the time to save these. They sent them afterward. So um, you can go back and share materials. So if you can't all go to every session, because some of them are obviously concurrent, you can swap materials and go through and say, hey, this one was really great. Did you get to this? And share your materials with each other. Um, and I did sit in on this class. This is not my normal class to go to. This is capital planning. This is money and numbers. I'm not a clerk treasurer. I am a clerk. But this was presented by the controller in Greenwood and his colleagues. And I sat in this. And this was probably one of the most useful classes that I've been in in a long time. They actually gave the participants worksheets that they could use. and. It's something that I plan on using beyond just city. I'm going to use it in the clerk's office. And um, I really enjoyed it. It was great. So it's something that I never would have gone in if I hadn't known the controller. And I hope that I can use it and share it with other people. Um, I do want to share something that one of our county colleagues shared. And he asked if I could share it with you. And he said, I would like to address the Common Council on the benefits of attending the in-person AIM conferences. I can honestly say the time spent there was some of the most productive time I've spent as an elected official. Not only are the breakdown sessions useful, the networking I did with both vendors and fellow elected officials will help Ellettsville with our future needs and some of the best practices we do will benefit others. I encourage all elected officials to occasionally attend these events as a time commitment will benefit your town or in your case, city. Thank you for your time and I hope to see you at the next AIM function if your schedule allows. And that is from William Ellis. So I'm going to say that next year the AIM Idea Summit will be held in August, not November, which is important to everybody because I'm sure there are going to be some pretty busy things going on in your schedules. But participants can register for just for the entire summit or just for one day, um, which I would encourage you to do or be creative and share your registration if you want to go just in the morning and want one of your colleagues go in the afternoon. You can do something like that. And there are affiliate groups for just council members, which is really great because you can talk about what works in your city and what doesn't. I've learned things by talking to other mayors that I think would be wonderful to implement here in Bloomington. And I've shared things that work here in Bloomington that I've seen other towns implement. And it works in smaller towns or from larger towns. Um, and I think it's a great way to get a lot of information for our community in a very short amount of time. So if you have any questions, I'm here. I'm happy to talk about AIM um, and other affiliate groups. And that is all I have for you this evening. Thank you very much. Any questions for Clerk Bolin? Councilmember Bolin. Thanks for the presentation. Very interesting. Um, is Greenwood a third class city? Is Greenwood? Yeah, they have a clerk treasurer. I cannot recall off the top of my because head. Because there's 63,000 people. That's a huge third class city. I just, do they still have a clerk treasurer? That's, that's you said that it was a presentation from? Controller. I said oh, controller. Okay. Got yes. It. All right. Thank Sorry. you. Yes. Thank you. That clears it up. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Hey, anyone else? Anyone else? Yes. Council Member P. Mount Smith. So is it normally a three-day event, or how many days does it Yes. Uh, the opening session was on Wednesday. The closing session was on Friday. But the bulk of the courses are on Wednesday and Thursday. OK. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. Anyone else? We appreciate the report. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. All right, and next up, council committees. Do we have any reports from council committees? And seeing none, we are to our first opportunity for public comment. And uh, while we're making the, um, the appeal to anyone who may be watching at home, I'd like to see a show of hands who in chambers would like to speak this evening. One, two, three, four. We have four hands, and we don't know how many we will have from the public. So we will need to limit the time to probably three minutes per commenter, but if you'd like to make the announcement, 
the four of you who are here in chambers, if you wouldn't mind queuing up to the podium, we'll have you sign in, state your name, and uh, everyone will have three minutes once we get started. And for those on Zoom, if you'd like to offer public comment now, please use the raise hand feature to indicate you'd like to speak. You can find that raise hand button in your control bar under the reactions tab or the more tab. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to comment. And I do see one hand raised at the moment on Zoom. All right, and we will start here in Chambers. Good evening, Council. This is Christopher M.G. from the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce. Um, I first of all want to thank those members of the Council who attended yesterday's community conversation on justice reform. Um, this may seem like a county function, but it's imperative that the city is involved in that collaborative process, which speaking of collaboration, I want to commend both uh, Madam President Sandberg and uh, Council Member uh, Scambolari on uh, their work on the Convention Center expansion last week. This is a tough, uh, difficult process, but I think we're moving forward with the uh, CIB, assuming this, uh, the bonding works um, for that. And I think uh, it is possible that we're going to see this expansion come through, and we appreciate all your patience on that. So now back to my uh, beautification. I appreciate the responses I did get back from council on this and just want to do a little part three on it. Um, beautification, this had to do with kind of the creed funding and kind of where those funds could go. Next slide. Uh, last time I, I just did a couple of the planters that were uh, in our city in June that we thought were looking a little shabby. Here's Chicago, Illinois planters that look full and uh, with a lot of vitality. So I want to give you some good examples of that. And next slide, thank you, Mr. Lucas. Uh, alleyways is the one thing I, I had mentioned, I think the first time as an example of uh, where we could do that beautification. We talk a lot about alleyways as um, assets of the city and uh, we don't vacate them, but I think we need a good stay staycation on the one on the left. You'll see from, uh, that's on Kirkwood, just east of uh, uh, Walnut. So, you can see the wires kind of hanging out there. And uh, the other one, I think, is just on the square on the north end, which it, it looks a little shabby, but it still could use some improvement. Next slide. There's a couple other ones. You see the one on the right I want to take focus on, which is on college off the square, which has that appeal that it could use just a little bit, a touch of beautification on it um, and really look great. And next one. I'm going to do a couple just examples of some good one, uh, Oskaloosa, Iowa, and then we have Las Vegas up there in Austin, of just some things we could do with those alleyways to spruce them up. And we uh, heard from uh, Clerk Bowling about strengthening the community through arts creativity. Well, this is, that's, this is what this is. Um, and this is kind of ways we can go do that with those Creed funds. Next slide. Uh, another one, Flint, Michigan did some lighting and another example. Next slide. And then uh, I had talked uh, with Council member uh, Piedmont Smith about crosswalks. Here's a couple of good examples, both from Long Beach and Richmond, uh, where they kind of added some color to their community through the crosswalks. Next slide. And then just some other simple but good little measures I think we could, we could use to spruce up our sort of downtown Kirkwood area. Next slide. Thank you for that. And so anyway, I wanted to just kind of go toward the, you know, beautification requires a creative collective of willing partners with innovative commitment in time and money. We have examples of this creativity with the sweaters aligning the sidewalks. Financially, we can do this through the Downtown Community Re Revitalization Enhancement District or Creed Funds to pay for it. That fund, 922, has $10.5 million in it. Thank you for your time tonight. Good timing. Thank you. Now we'll go to someone who is on Zoom. Yes, uh, first, and uh, you'll see her frequently on Zoom is Jim Shelton. Welcome, Mr. Shelton. You will have three minutes. Is he unmuted? Is he with us? Good evening, Council. Jim Shelton, following my boss. But I want to talk about a different subject. I want to uh, update you in the community about uh, the status of our CASA system. Uh, CASA has decided uh, its training schedule for 2023. The next session will start in just about two months, which means the applications will be due in about six weeks. Since the next six weeks are going to be crazy busy with uh, 
Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's, uh, I wanted to uh, alert the public right now to give them time to look into it and see if this might be a volunteer opportunity for them. CASAs are court-appointed special advocates. They are assigned by the court, well, they're requested by the court when a child is in the juvenile justice system because their parents have abused or neglected them. And the CASA's job is to help the court know what's going on in the life of that child and in the lives of the parents of that child. So the CASA becomes, in effect, the eyes and ears of the court. They're not in charge of fixing the problem. They're just in charge of helping the judge know what is going on so that the judge, he or she, can decide what measure would best be taken to indeed fix the problem. So your job would be to visit with the child periodically, usually about once a month, and then to see how the child's doing, but also see how the parents are doing. The children will have been removed from the home of the, of the uh, parents, and uh, the parents will have been giving a number of instructions as to what they need to do to be reunited with their child or children. The CASA will help monitor how those are doing and help the court understand and know how the parents are doing. If the children are old enough, you might want to visit with uh, their school or with service providers if they're having counselors provided by the court. And again, your job will be to report back to the court what uh, is happening in those uh, areas. You would not be working the case by yourself. You would have the option to accept a case or to decline it if for some reason it didn't suit you. Maybe it was uh, the child uh, was out of town, uh, too far away for you to uh, visit. But uh, you would then have a CASA employee uh, to work with you on the case so that you had access to an expert, if you will, when uh, you were dealing with the case. So I invite people to go to MonroeCountyCASA.org. You'll find a volunteer link and then an orientation and training sublink. You can check on those. There's also a link to frequently asked questions and you can learn a lot more about it. You would have about six weeks, which uh, will go by really fast to uh, get applications in. So I wanted to share that with you in the community and thank you for the opportunity to do so. Thank you, Mr. Shelton. I'm now here in Chambers. Um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, hi, my name is Greg Alexander. Um, I made the conscious decision about four years ago that I wasn't going to come to this council with technical diagrams. Um, as much as I'd love to see you all micromanaging intersections, how can I sell it in three minutes? Anyways, <laughs> this is from the uh, engineering plans for the 17th Street side path, which is supposed to be a project to improve pedestrian safety. It's the intersection of Kinzer and 17th. Next slide, please, Mr. Lucas. Thank you. Um, kind of a lot to take in, so I added some color to make it legible. The red line is the old curb, and the blue line is the new curb. The project is going to widen the intersection. This is supposed to help pedestrians, but they're actually spending a big chunk of the money on increasing car capacity by widening the intersection. The crossing distance for pedestrians is increasing from 46 to 52 feet, and this is the path of the side path. Um, pedestrians are going to be exposed to hazards from turning traffic for a longer period of time. It's going to reduce driver compliance. They're not going to yield to pedestrians when making a right turn on red, for example. It reduces the pedestrian level of service. They'll have a shorter white walk kind of signal and a longer red flashing hand to account for the longer crossing. This is awful design is going to be built next year. It is going to get people hurt. Already with the existing design, there was a fatality at this intersection last year. This is a high stress location for every roadway user and especially for pedestrians, and they're spending our money to make it worse. The worst part is the intersection is already too wide. The transportation plan says the crossing should be on the order of 34 feet, but they're increasing it to 52 feet instead. I've been bird dogging this project for two and a half years now. Is coming to council the magic ingredient that I've been missing all this time? Are you going to micromanage this one? Honestly, I, I don't think you will, and I'm sorry to waste your time. So now there's precedent though. Um, next, next slide please, Mr. Lucas. Um, thank you. <laughs> a citizen wrote an ordinance and then was given 28 minutes to present it to you guys. Uh, a huge step forward for participatory government, I guess. What does that mean for the rest of us? Are we going to be allowed that same privilege? Can we aim for real substantive change or do we have to stick to stop signs in front of our own houses? All right, I know two different stop signs in my neighborhood people have been asking for. 
Um, they've both been blown off by low-level staff in the Planning and Transportation Department. I get it. Engineering is a tiny department and doesn't have the staff resources to re-evaluate every intersection in the city. Are you guys going to meet with my neighbors for 28 minutes and let them make their case? Are council members now going to take on this chore of separating the well-thought-out requests from the worthless whining? Are you? Activists need to know. How do we get the same deference? Or is that, you know, for someone else, not for us? Thanks. Thank you. Who do we have at home on Zoom? And I, we had a fourth person here in shape. If you want to go ahead and... Thank you. Hi, I see no more takers on Zoom at the moment. All right, and our last speaker here in Chambers. Uh, Daryl Rubel, citizen of Bloomington. I just want to say thank you for the, the great work that the City of Bloomington Street Department does. Uh, Snow Patrol, they're getting ready to go do it probably because the weather's turning bad. They do a great job. I worked down there for a few years and I know exactly what they're getting ready to go through. And they're, you need, everybody needs to appreciate them a little bit more and slow down when they're out plowing their roads. They do a great job. That's a, that's a real hard job. When you're out in the middle, middle of the night plowing snow just two, three o'clock in the morning, that's dedication, man. And them guys are all dedicated there. Joe Van Devener is my hero. He's a great boss, a great man doing a great job. And you guys, when he retires, you guys are gonna miss that guy because he, he's a really great guy, okay? And the other thing too, uh, utilities, thank them guys. They do a great job. I, I, you know, the water tastes great. Utilities, they do a great job by supplying water to us. It always tastes good, man. There's, there, you know, a lot of people, oh, it's discolored, it don't taste right. Well, I've never been dissatisfied. Them guys do a great job, especially when utilities out late at night and they're, they're digging a hole in the road for a main break, and you see them guys in that water? You know, that's dedication right there, and them guys are dedicated, man. You got some great city workers. And we'll go in another direction with some more city workers. I had an interaction the other day with a, a couple of Bloomington police officers, Anthony Fosnaw and Officer Dunn. Them guys treated me very respectable, I was completely satisfied with the end result. Uh, I called them over something that happened south of town there. They come, treat me great. Uh, we got a great Bloomington police force. Uh, you know, they're, they're great guys. Anthony Fosnaw, I love the guy. He's, 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 he's treated me great over the years. I've dealt with him before, but uh, great dude. But I want to dedicate my last minute to the aborted babies that have been aborted in this country. For, And thank you, Mr. Rubel. You are at your time. Yeah, I just want to reiterate that minute was for the aborted children that have been aborted in this country, have been, will be in the future. And uh, thank you. And again, that will conclude public comment for this evening. Are we ready to have any appointments to boards and commissions at this time? And seeing none, we are ready for legislation for second readings and resolutions. Madam President, I move to take. Ordinance 2215 from the table. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. We are ready now to proceed with Ordinance 22-15, and we might take this time now to have anyone from staff, or is our petitioner here with us this evening, to do a um, review of where we are with this matter that is now being brought back on the table. Yes, and. Just notes our 
petitioner, uh, I believe represented by Mike Cordero and Joe Patrick are here on Zoom. I believe here in Chambers we have uh, city staff. I don't know if there's any update uh, city staff would like to provide at this time. I think they're mostly here for questions. Uh, I know the petitioner uh, may be prepared to give an update on uh, their efforts since the council last discussed this item uh, at its July 20th meeting. Very good, Mr. Cordero. Are you ready to uh, give us a review? Hi, yes. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you all for, uh, for having us back today. Um, we wanted to give every, uh, everyone an update and ultimately hope uh, to receive a vote uh, this evening um, on our petition. Uh, since we, we last spoke, we have been working uh, diligently with st city staff um, and a few of the departments, the planning uh, department and the Board of Public Works um, to go over the steps and process for uh, us dedicating a new right of way uh, in exchange for the vacation of the existing right of way. Um, we feel at this point uh, comfortable and confident that the Board of Public Works uh, is is going to accept our dedication. Uh, there's been, you know, a lot of confusion. It's not the the most straightforward uh, process uh, here in terms of steps to get it done. Um, but uh, as as it sits now, we are here to request that the that the council uh, votes to vacate the alley, and then we are on the agenda for the board of public works uh, for. Uh, I believe it's. November 22nd, where we will uh, be uh, offering to dedicate the new right of way. All right, very good. Do we want to hear as a council, do we want to hear from um, Andrew Seabor, our engineer, before we ask questions of maybe both the petitioner and the, and the staff? I'm seeing head nods, so thank you, Mr. Seabor, for giving us uh, your take. Sure. Uh, good evening, council members. And just for the record, I believe Scott Robinson is signed in virtually if there are questions in relation to planning and transportation uh, elements. Um, I'm here primarily to answer any questions that you may have. Um, I uh, want to also echo that the petition to dedicate a new alley right of way is on the draft agenda for next week's Board of Public Works meeting. Um, I guess the one point that I want to clarify is um, I don't think the Board of Public Works has at all weighed in um, or actually seen the proposal officially in any way, so I'm not in a position to say that I'm confident that they would accept that dedication and, and also just want to clarify that the, the engineering department has indicated to the developers um, that we would anticipate providing a negative recommendation to that proposed dedication. And I'm happy to answer any questions or to go into more details on that if it's desired. All right, and uh, will Mr. Robinson want to add anything to that or should he just be on call for questions? Good evening, Mr. Robinson. <laughs> Good evening, Scott Robinson, Director of Planning and Transportation. I do not have anything to add, Council Member President, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right, very good. So we will now go to Council to see if we have any questions. Council Member Flaherty. Yes, thank you, Mr. Cordero, Mr. Seabor, and Robinson. Um, Mr. Seabor, I'm, I'm guessing, uh, could you explain a bit more about why the uh, City Administration would intend to uh, have a negative recommendation for dedication of uh, the proposed dedication of right of way, uh, just just a bit south of the uh, existing right of way we're considering. And sure, I'll just jump in here if it's helpful to see a diagram. I know the petitioner provided a, a schematic in the packet. So I'm happy to display that if that would be helpful. I think that would be. Um, yeah, great question. I probably should have just jumped into that right in my initial presentation. Um, but yeah, you can see on the the map that we're all looking at here the. The red area is the existing right-of-way that exists. The blue is the proposed right-of-way dedication um, that is on next week's Board of Public Works agenda. Um, I think there's, there's a few items I guess I want to touch on. Um, one of them is that within this blue area, the proposed right-of-way dedication, um, underneath that facility um, is the development's proposed stormwater detention uh, facility for basically 
uh, where they're intending to detain any stormwater from their private property. Um, so that would essentially be a, a significant encroachment into a public space that they would essentially be responsible to maintain. Um, I think consumes close to half of that area. So it's just an extremely large utility encroachment, a private utility encroachment into the right of way. So that's one item. Um, another is that it is um, this area that's identified in blue was designed to be a private facility um, to serve their, their parcel. It's, uh, it only uh, it is uh, directly adjacent to the proposed development's property. There's no other property that it serves. And as a part of the dedication, it, it's, they haven't, nothing has changed. So it was designed with the intent of being private. And, and I, there, it doesn't connect to other facilities. Um, it doesn't serve other properties. There is just limited um, public benefit, at least from a public works engineering type of perspective um, of that additional right away. Um, I think those are the, the main points. I might be missing a couple, but those are a couple I wanted to highlight. Can I follow up on the same? Yes, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Seaport. The, the two main things you just described, um, private utility encroachment into the proposed right-of-way and um, limited sort of current utility uh, based on access, lack of connection to other properties, aren't those same uh, criticisms also true of the existing strip of, of red right-of-way seen in the diagram? Um, the second item I listed, I think, is similar, but there are no private utilities that I'm aware of in the existing right away. I don't think there's any utilities in the existing right away. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member P. Munt Smith. Oh, I had the same questions, thank you. Oh, no question? All right, Council Member Volan. Uh, just to drill down a little bit more here, so the current right of way, if I'm reading that map correctly, uh, the circle on that map as at the end of the current right-of-way um, is the brick building known as the smokestack, right? So literally the smokestack is standing in right-of-way. I mean, I don't see that smokestack. I mean, now that they've taken it down and it's, I think it's historic, it's never gonna go away. Um, you know, why would we care about that corner of this right-of-way? I'm not sure I 100% understand the question besides it's just it is an existing right of way so we care about the existing right of way. Okay. But I mean the existing right of way also doesn't connect to anything. I mean it seems like it ought to connect to the B line since it's right there. Is there some way that we can make it connect to the B line? It currently does not connect. Um, and there is a historic feature that limits the likelihood that it will connect, at least in the, a straight, uh, linear fashion. We also, we own land in between the end of that right of way and the, the B line. So our, our property actually goes around the right of way. It dead ends into our, Wait, our property. Wait, Mr. Cordero, slow down, say that again. Your property does what? Our property extends around uh, the the what uh, the east side of the existing right of way, so it, that right of way doesn't bisect our entire property. Okay, um, thank you. So far, I guess I'm still trying to wrap my head around this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Councilmember Piedmont Smith? Yes. So um, I'm also trying to understand. Uh, the significance of the private utility being placed under what is proposed to be a public right of way. So does that mean if there are repairs needed to the retention basin, um, the developer or the owner would have to get permission from the city to go under there and fix it? Question. So, so the answer is yes. Um, so essentially, that's something that we would manage through our right of way use permit. Anytime anybody needs to use the public right of way, we would manage it that way. 
Um, and the other way we would want to clarify from a long-term perspective, if this was approved and if that was provided in that location, um, we would typically want to do like what's called an encroachment agreement to, to record that it is the private properties responsibly to maintain that um, in the future, and also a recognition that if in the future for some reason or another that encroachment became problematic from a public perspective, like it needed to go out of or maybe a city project or something else, um, that that property would be responsible to have it removed or relocated. Um, I know the developers have indicated um, a willingness to agree to the standard encroachment agreement, um, but I think, as, as I mentioned in the work session on this topic, um, the realities is that this encroachment would be serving a building that would exist, and so if we were to remove the stormwater capacity required due to this new structure, it would in a way be now creating a non-compliant structure that we no longer have stormwater storage capacity for. Um, so there's some, some ripple effects in that. Does, does, does that make sense? Okay. Um, so is there any precedent? Are there other places in the city where there is private um, utility infrastructure under a public right-of-way? Yes, that's another great question. And the answer is yes, there are other private utility encroachments in the public right-of-way. Um, but the unique feature about this one is just the scale of it. Um, often things like grease interceptors or other things sometimes can be located in the right-of-way, but they're much smaller in magnitude um, and, and don't comprise the vast majority of the right-of-way. And if I may, one more. Yes, um, so uh, as an engineer, do you uh, have any reticence in uh, supporting a public street over a retention basin? I mean, do we have other places where there's a a city-owned retention base, detention retention basin over a city street. It, is that, and as far as an engineering perspective, is that a safe or wise thing to do? Um, I mean, we have underground um, stormwater features throughout the city with various culverts, and the CBU has recently undertaken some major efforts to upgrade many of those, which can be very costly. But so they they do exist. Um, the uh, stormwater detention component is probably underground, um, less common than just conveying stormwater. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not aware of anywhere it is detaining stormwater from the private property. Sometimes it may be possible that we're detaining water from the street or the public right-of-way in the public right-of-way, but this is unique that it's stormwater from the private property. But as far as the stability of the actual build, you don't see a issue with that? We would make sure it's all engineered and has stamp plans and, and that sort of thing. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Member Scambellari. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I uh, thank you in advance for your patience with this question. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this, this process correctly. Um, so the question before us has to do with the red. The question before the Board of Public Works has to do with the blue, correct? All right, good, all right, so far. <laughs> um, so if we choose to vacate if we vote this evening to vacate our right of way for the red and Public Works does not approve the request, then we have no right of way anywhere in there, correct? That would be my understanding, and others might want to weigh in a little bit on the, the process. Okay. And, and, and is, is, if you have any comment, Mr. Lucas, on this, the conditional nature of this, um, I would find that helpful and clarifying. So. Yes. I believe the petitioner, uh, in response to comments at the July 20th meeting, has been uh, working to uh, pursue a relocation of, of this alley. Uh, they, they looked at a few different mechanisms, and I think they landed on this dedication of right-of-way as the most direct uh, route. Uh, in working with city staff, uh, they uh, discovered that uh, dedicating the, the blue strip first and then coming back to the council uh, pose challenges. I think there were certain points of no return that they felt, and, and uh, uh, Mr. Cordero or, or Mr. Patrick can correct me if I'm wrong, they, they felt uncomfortable passing those points without uh, knowing that the council would in fact vacate the, the red portion. Uh, in addition, uh, there was a wrinkle that if they dedicated a new alley first, uh, they would have to dedicate, uh, they were told, I understand, that they would have to dedicate that little white 
strip in between uh, uh, to make it contiguous and then come back to the council and ask that that plus the red portion be vacated. Uh, so there, there were these odd hiccups um, that led them to the point uh, where we are now, uh, where they would like, uh, they're requesting that the council vacate the, the existing alley uh, with the uh, intent that they will propose uh, dedicating the, the blue strip uh, next week. Uh, so if the council uh, was intending to uh, vacate uh, the existing alley uh, with the um, uh, hope that the city would accept a new alley shown in blue, uh, that's why uh, Mr. Seabor is here tonight to explain the recommendation the Board of Public Works is, is uh, set to receive. Um, I, I will note, um, uh, should the council vote to vacate uh, this alley tonight, uh, I believe the petitioner is on the agenda for the November 22nd, uh, next Tuesday, Board of Public Works meeting. Uh, in, in working through this issue with uh, uh, engineering staff, with uh, city legal and the mayor's office, um, I just wanted to note the mayor uh, does have a 10-day period from uh, the council's passage of an ordinance and the clerk's presenting that to him to sign uh, or, or veto the ordinance. Uh, so it, it may very well be the case that the mayor waits to see what happens at the Board of Public Works meeting to decide whether to, uh, to sign this ordinance. That's an option open to him. Uh, I think especially if the council indicates some desire um, uh, to make this vacation uh, depend on, on the acceptance of, the, of a new alley, uh, that, that's one avenue he can help facilitate that. The council tonight can, can simply decide to vacate the existing alley, uh, and uh, that's, that's the question before you. If, if you would like to do so uh, with the hope that the blue alley will be accepted by the Board of Public Works, I'd encourage you to make that, that clear tonight, if that helps. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Anyone else? with a question. Yes. There are a couple of responses, um, I think, oh. via Zoom that may need to be All recognized. All right, so um, do we have Mr. Robinson who wants to make a comment first? Thanks, Council Member President uh, Sandberg. Uh, I do want to clarify the, the private utility that Mr. Seabor was talking about. Uh, that was part of the voluntary uh, sustainability incentive uh, the petitioners were using to get the additional floor. So the stormwater uh, feature is one of the green building features that they chose, voluntary chose to uh, receive for the incentive on that site. So I just wanted to point that out as a point of, point of fact, nothing more than uh, that utility that would be located under the blue portion of the proposed alley. All right, thank you for that. And the second hand that's up, were you wanting to respond to a council question? Um, yeah, this is uh, Joe Patrick uh, with Peerless Development. Uh, I just wanted to, if I had a moment to supplement some of the uh, explanations that Mr. Seabor had provided, um, is specifically relative to the uh, private infrastructure for utility infrastructures underneath public locations and public right-of-way. Um, as part of our process over the past few months, um, we've done research of other similar installations, uh, definitely not a stormwater, a private stormwater installation, but other similar private utility installations underneath public right-of-ways, uh, many of which are, are on, you'd find unfortunately on sidewalks um, in areas where that are, are very prominent. Uh, and those are either water vaults or uh, I think Mr. Seabor had mentioned uh, grease interceptors, which are items that require a lot more maintenance, inspection, and um, often with grease interceptors, cleaning. Um, this stormwater vaults, while it is a large structure, um, the reality is that the bulk of it is simply a concrete box or a, a, a metal box that's underneath the, the sidewalk. So there's there's not a lot of mechanisms and, and components to it that require a lot of maintenance and inspections. Um, it does require some regulars, but, but there's not a lot of moving parts. Um, the only bits and pieces that you may see are a couple of manhole covers in an alley, which is, is very normal. So I, I just wanted to make sure that the, the way it was portrayed that this is a, a very large, you know, component that could be problematic 
is maybe not so accurate when the written reality all you're, you'll be seeing is a few manhole structures, manhole lids uh, on the alleyway. And um, to, to one minor uh, also alternate, there, there are existing utilities underneath that existing alley. They, they are, they're electrical and um, telecommunication cablings that cross those. Um, considering that the existing alley was not really recognized as an alley previously, it's probably the case that those utilities do not have um, the, the required, I guess, agreements in place for those. So that's, you know, just neither here nor there, but there are existing utilities underneath that existing red portion of the alley that we're showing you um, that we would be relocating and taking care of as part of the proposed new development um, that would be occurring on the kind of northern half of this site. Um, so it's um, it, it, a lot of that would kind of get cleaned up, if you will, with this proposed swap of existing alley for new dedicated alley. Um, we're hoping trying to clean it up and keep it from getting messier, I guess. All right, thank you for that clarification. Are there other uh, questions here from council? Uh, council member Flaherty and then council member Bowen. Thank you, uh, a few follow-ups, yeah. First is with Mr. C um, um, Robinson. Uh, thank you for that note uh, about the, the detention basin uh, underneath the building. And could you clarify the proposed design um, does take advantage of the sustainability incentives within the Unified Development Ordinance, is that right? Or would take advantage of? Yes, the, the petition, which was approved by the plan commission on the condition that the alley be vacated, they, they did voluntarily choose to uh, leverage the sustainability incentives uh, for this project. Um, I will also note that I believe um, at the October, uh, I got to get my plan commission meetings correct, at the October plan commission meeting, they reheard the case again to extend the site plan. Uh, site plans do have a shelf life, uh, so the plan commission did agree to extend the, the site plan approval, uh, mostly to allow the petitioners the opportunity to consider this alley vacation as it's taking some time. Thank you. Um, I have another follow-up or two, if that's okay. Um, Mr. Seabor, I think you were speaking uh, in response to Mr. Volan's question uh, to um, the value of, of the current existing um, right-of-way pictured here in red. Uh, based on its historic and current and likely future, you know, anticipated possible future uses, near-term future uses. Could you speak a little more to what um, you or the, and the city see as the value of the, the current um, right-of-way? So the tricky part is I might lean a little bit on, on Mr. Doc, Director Robinson to talk about the vacation of the existing. I was mostly intending to talk about the proposed new, but there certainly are a lot of parallels um, I think to, to talk a little bit about the blue, the proposed alley, um, you know, if it is an improved alley, a dedicated right of way, um, one would expect that it is a publicly maintained facility. Um, and we would, that's just an, an extra burden that potentially falls onto the, the public to be responsible for maintaining what is essentially a private facility. And, and there may be parallels to be drawn with, with the red as well, but I, um, I think that maybe I'll try to turn it over to you, uh, Director Hubbinson, to talk just a little bit more about the potential utility of the, the red, the existing alley. Looks like he froze. Is Mr. Robinson frozen? Can everybody hear me? My internet is. You're not going to get any help from your While, while he's breaking up, I guess I don't have it in front of me, but in the packet was the planning and transportation prepared a memo, and the last line of that memo provided their recommendation. And I think it, I'm going by memory, essentially stated they didn't have significant concerns with the vacation of the right-of-way, but that the space has some value in for that to be considered by the council. I'm, I, I, we've had a lot of discussions about right-of-way this year and sort of the inherent value of it, uh, even if it's not being used currently, because we don't know what the future holds. And I, I generally very much agree with that and buy into that. Um, I think 
you know, it's pretty unlikely this will ever connect through to the east, you know, barring like an act of God that takes down the historically protected tower or something like that. Um, but I see other potential values of, of, you know, alleys even that are stubs like this. Um, but I'm, what I'm having a hard time with is uh, reconciling the reasoning, uh, defending the current red right of way, and not recommending dedication of the blue right of way. It doesn't seem to me like there are uh, meaningful enough differences to to lead to different outcomes, which is what we're hearing from the administration. So I guess I'm, that's what I'm trying to clarify. So if that helps in in uh, giving any feedback, I'd, I'd welcome additional input. Or if if not, that's okay too. I think putting on city engineering and potentially trying to act um, as a representative of the Board of Public Works, but not, I can't speak to what the Board of Public Works would expect, but from, from that capacity, there is um, additional risk and maintenance burdens of having dedicated right of way that truly serve a single property and don't have significant um, public utility or transportation benefits. Um, so, so there, from, from that hat, I think there, there just is limited. Um... Sorry, sorry. Just from that perspective, though, then wouldn't, following that reasoning to its logical end, wouldn't you want the red right of way to be de uh, vacated because it's a liability, as you just described? Like... Um, I, from an engineering department's perspective, I don't think there are significant concerns with that being vacated due to the lack of connectivity um, that it currently provides. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Bolan. Yeah, I mean, this is along the same lines and uh, we have people from utilities here uh, to talk about it, but I mean, for more than 20 years, I've been familiar with the big dig in the underground river that goes under uh, downtown Bloomington from Dun Meadow to First and Rogers, uh, or First and Walnut. We actually had a fugitive in that culvert. Um, and it runs underneath many, many private properties and has for many, many years. And it is absolutely the obligation of the city to maintain it, uh, CBU and, and everyone else. And uh, I mean, to follow on Mr. Flaherty's question, I mean, uh, this is, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of not even understanding what utilities the city will be obligated to maintain if the the major thing underneath the new alley would be the culvert that serves the building that they would have to maintain. Uh, this seems, I, I hate to use the word trivial, but it seems like a, tr a trivial space. Uh, is, it, is, it, is it safe to say that staff uh, does not support vacating this because uh, of principle? Um, like it's just the principle that they that, that you don't want to see. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know how else to phrase it, and so I'm trying to be delicate about it, but is it the principle that's the matter here? Of That we shouldn't be vacating right of way if we can help it? I guess um, I haven't been at all of the discussions on this topic, but I, I am personally not aware of, um, at least engineering department, I, I don't know. Um, what the cons if we have expressly ex ex expressed an opinion that we have concerns with the vacation of the alley, um, just that it is something that needs to be looked at very carefully. Which, I think that's what we're doing tonight. We're trying to look at it very carefully, and I keep coming up with very little uh, to preserve. I, I, I'm I'm struggling. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. I see Mr. Cordero's hand is up. Do you have a response or a comment? Uh, sorry. Um, it was just a, a follow-up um, comment. I think uh, what Andrew was saying is the, the cost of maintaining and, and operating the right-of-way for the city is you know, the, the pavement, you know, that has to be repaired every now and again. I don't know if lighting would be uh, necessary to be provided, but there's, I think what he was saying is there's a cost for the city to continue to own and maintain um, a working right of way. And I also wanted to mention that this, this alley would serve um, two properties, right? It would serve the proposed new um, apartment building 
and it would serve the, the parking spaces for the Johnson Creamery office building, which currently we own both of them, um, but that might not be the case in the future. Um, so yes, it, it serves limited public, uh, I guess, um, property owners, but uh, it, would, it, would serve, it does serve two properties. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Robinson, your hand is back up. Are you back in a better connection? My apologies for my technology failing. Um, and hopefully people can see and hear me. Uh, so I, again, apologize. I think there was a question asked, but that was about the last point in time I was able to hear with the conversation. So happy to answer any follow up with any questions. Thank you. Um, the, the question I have, it seems to me that when last we were visiting this topic and before this got put on the table, there was a question put to us about if we vacate the, the red, the, the pink, the alley as it exists, that there might be some public benefit to the project as it relates to the, the area to consider this blue um, um, proposal. So we've heard from engineering, we've heard from staff what your, your objections might be and why you will be recommending a negative to the BP, BPW, uh, Board of Public Works. Um, is there at all any public benefit with given that the plan commission has already approved this project and uh, he's uh, poised and ready to go, is there a, any kind of benefit to um, accepting the, the new proposed alley? Um, at least from engineering department assessment and what would be presented to the board while it works is um, there is very limited benefit. I struggle to think of significant public benefit from that public works perspective. Um, is there any harm? I think the, the harm, I think actually the, the peerless representatives touched on is, is just the potential of the long-term maintenance costs um, of taking that into the public's inventory, f recognizing it is really serving a private property. It's not much different than if some, I wanted to dedicate my driveway to the public, so now I don't need to maintain my driveway, um, and now it's the taxpayer's responsibility. All right, thank you for that. Additional questions, I see Council Member Volan and then yeah, Council Member Piedmont. Uh, Madam President, your question. Um, we've discovered in the course of this extended consideration that there is already an existing right-of-way that is the city's obligation to take care of that none of us knew about before the project came forward. So we have that obligation anyway. So why the red land and not the blue? I mean, if we already have an obligation to take care of it, uh, that sounds to me like you're suggesting that we should just vacate it and not have a right-of-way. Uh, but I, I'm pretty sure that that's not what you're uh, recommending either. So can you, can you untangle this knot for me? I guess I, it might be messy, but I'm, I'm not necessarily making a recommendation one way or other on the vacation. I'm here to represent the, the blue dedication. Um, and, and maybe Peerless or others that could, are more familiar with the history of the site could speak to it. But as far as I'm aware, the city may not have been actively maintaining the existing red space. Right. Um, so in other words, uh, what you're saying is because of the potentially uh, approved, to be approved development, uh, we're going to find ourselves uh, saddled, for lack of a better word, with a new alley that we didn't have to take care of before. Uh, but regardless of whether we approve the project or not, we are still saddled with that alley. We, now that we know it exists, we can't ignore it unless we vacate it. Uh, and we're, the council is not interested in vacating it so that we don't have to think about it anymore. We were talking about a swap, and they proposed a swap, and it's right next door. And uh, we had the obligation anyway. So uh, maybe this question is for Mr. Robinson. I don't know. I think just one piece, and I, maybe this is another, starts to touch on public works as well, is, is the ongoing maintenance. So if it is a dedicated public right-of-way, that's an alley. Um, in theory, the city should be responsible for maintaining that public alley. 
but the, the reality is, is we, it's a prioritization exercise of how much we spend maintaining our public facilities. And right. when we have roads in the condition they are, the alleys, especially alleys that serve single use. So there would be an incremental uh, expense to maintaining this alley because if we were to approve this project and we have to weigh that in to whether or not we want, I mean like, this should be part of our consideration in deciding whether or not to approve the project. Is that a safe summary of the situation? I might be starting to, to fade and I do apologize. <laughs> no, um, I understand. I think just, big, the project can't proceed without the vacation right, of this alley. Right, um, The cost of this project to us includes the ongoing maintenance of this newly discovered alley, no matter which position it's in. I mean, actually, I take it back. Even if we don't approve the project, we still have to take care of the alley. There will be less care to take because there's no project next to it. Uh, so, I, I mean, have I got that right? Correct. So essentially, if I'm hearing this correct, if, if the va existing alley is not vacated, this project cannot move forward as currently approved. Right. Um, and we would now have know and be more aware of this existing alley that is dedicated right away. And Okay, I think you've answered my question. I appreciate it. Thank you. If Mr. Robinson wants to chime in, I don't want to deprive him of the opportunity uh, now that we can hear him again. Thank you, Council Member Bowen. I'm going to kind of recycle back to your other question about, you know, the, the challenge that staff has on recommending a vacating right-of-ways. Um, it is challenging because it is a uh, public benefit for us to uh, maintain right-of-ways and We've had an awful lot of discussions about alleys on this request and other requests. Um, and so it is a difficult uh, question to ask about the potential of this existing alley or the, the new one, the, blow, the blue one, and what it benefit it has to the public. I believe my memo outlined that technically um, the red alley, you know, kind of meets the criteria. I, I do believe petitioners did say that there were um, some private utilities that were located in there, but in our process for having utilities identify if they are uh, within that red alley, we did not receive any uh, comments during that period. So um, I would say that this particular alley does have some unique characteristics, um, particularly because it doesn't connect to anything to the east. Again, talking about the red right. alley, that's largely due to the former CSX railroad, which was Part of a rails to trails program that converted that to right. um, the, the beeline trail. Um, and then, as you noted, the smokestack is an encroachment. Um, and again, it's not unusual to have encroachments in our right of way. So the question really be has started out is what's the public benefit of uh, this alley versus the, the red alley? And I think that's why the proposal was introduced to kind of have a, an exchange of property per se for one to, for the other. Right. Um, so that's that's where we come at is I think what what you know Director Seaboard is talking about is the challenges of how that blue alley um, does it serve any public benefit much like does the red one um, you know both of these largely serve this property in itself um, and in either scenario the the utilities largely serve the developments itself both the private development both as it is today or as it's proposed. So the question goes back to the value of, of this public piece of property. And, and there is some value to it, what that value is. That's not a question for staff to come up with. Um, but I do know that this is a question that will be asked again of other projects coming down the line. Uh, Council's considered alley vacations in the past and our, and our um, standard has been, no, we do not recommend uh, uh, vacations of right away um, for that reason. However, this is a very unique case. And so I think that's why it's been taking so long to figure that out. I appreciate both your answers and I thank you. And I, I, I feel like I understand now. Thank you. Thank you. Council member Piedmont Smith. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask about a historical marker uh, to commemorate um, the smokestack. Uh, this summer, of course, there was a proposal from the administration to have a dedication of a significant amount of money towards public art in exchange for vacation of the alley, which um, I did not agree with. But I do, uh, 
I, I would like to see that smokestack uh, and the history of the Johnson Creamery uh, commemorated in some way uh, with a marker or, or something. So I'm wondering, um, and maybe along the lines of, um, you know, $7,000 or $10,000 uh, rather than the hundreds of thousands discussed in the summer. So I'd like to hear the feedback from uh, Mr. Cordero uh, about that idea. I think that's something that our firm would be on board with, absolutely. Is there, um, can I just ask uh, our um, council attorney if there's any way to uh, have a commitment of that? I think the council could uh, amend the ordinance before you to uh, indicate the petitioner's intent to uh, either install a marker or provide funding for the city to do that. Um, uh, to get into the details of how that would operate tonight might be difficult, um, uh, but certainly a memorialization of, of the intent could be written fairly quickly tonight. Um, I don't know how binding that would be, and, and that may leave some ambiguity later on, but. Uh, it's, it's up to the council how it would like to proceed and if it, if it wants that in place before voting tonight on this ordinance. All right, thank you. If there are no further council questions in this round, let's go to the public right now and we can certainly come back with more questions. That's some interesting food for thought there. Um, so any member of the public here, either in chambers or at home on Zoom, wish to make a comment, please approach the podium and you would have three minutes. Hi, everyone. I'm Vic Kelston, Director of Utilities. I've come here with uh, great trepidation, but I did want to clear up a couple of things. Uh, we have miles of unimproved alleys in the city, and from the perspective of the Utilities Department, those are places where one day we may need to put pipes uh, for future projects. Uh, if you remember, we just recently finished the Hidden River Project. Uh, we spent a lot of money buying easements when we built that project. Um, acquiring easements is a pretty big part of the larger projects that we do. Now, I've spoken with uh, our in Assistant Director for Engineering, Phil Peden, this evening. Uh, Phil uh, tells me that our pipes in this area are in 8th Street, so they really wouldn't, are not involved right now in that red uh, right-of-way. But say we did need to use, uh, use the red right-of-way, we would have to buy an easement on one end or the other. That's just the way it would work. Um, the blue right-of-way, if it has private infrastructure underneath it, uh, we would not be able to use that, utilize that for our own buried infrastructure, although you could have a sidewalk or whatever. Uh, our opinion was that this doesn't offer any present day, impede, it would not impede anything that we're doing right now, and once a building is sitting on top of it, it uh, probably would not affect us very much. But one of the reasons why the utilities department, generally speaking, uh, doesn't like alley vacations is because that might be a place where we have to put something one day. So that it's not simply, uh, I think uh, Council Member Voland said, is this a matter of principle? It's actually a matter of protecting ourselves from a murky and unpredictable future. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Is there any hands going up from our <coughs> Zoom participants? I see no hands currently. I'll just extend an invitation for those watching on Zoom. If you'd like to comment uh, on this ordinance, please use the raise hand feature to indicate you'd like to speak. You can find that in your control bar under the reactions tab or the more tab. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to comment. All right, anyone else here in chambers wish to make a comment? no takers on Zoom. No hands. Let's come back to council if we have additional questions first before we go to final comments. Council Member Boland. Well, uh, Mr. Kelson's given me something new to think about and I kind of wish we had uh, included him in the questions before. I guess we could still ask, but um, the problem I'm having now with his statement is that, I mean, I know and I'm glad that he, as a director of utilities, is thinking in 100-year terms, like he has a 100-year plan for the replacement of water mains. That's something that's incumbent upon us to do as a city if we're really on top of maintaining our infrastructure. 
But there's something older than that that we have to think about, and that is American history of railroads. So railroads are unique in America. They have land rights that no other entity does. And we got this railroad uh, conveyed to us um, for use as a trail. Um, the one thing I'm pretty confident about is that that trail will never not be a trail. Like, why would the city ever give that up? I mean, the only reason that we have an interest in the extension of this alley as a connectivity uh, vehicle is if there was going to be some kind of connection to the trail, which, I mean, it kind of already is. Like, I cut across that lot on a bike to get onto the trail. I'm not sure how it's going to change with the building, but I bet you there's going to be a curb cut and that you're going to be able to, say, ride your bike or move your wheelchair between that parking lot and the, and the, the, ra the trail. So, again, I'm sort of struggling with uh, the, I mean, as, I think that staff has made a more compelling case than I was ready to uh, accept uh, on behalf of this, um, this item. It does still come down to principle. Uh, Mr. Kellison's made that very clear, um, that that's the principle. We have to think in 100-year terms. Uh, but uh, like there are two properties being served by the alley, not one. Uh, it's disingenuous to say that it's just for this property, that it's, it's for two. Um, the property will never be connected to another alley to the other side uh, unless we get rid of the Beeline Trail. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I just, I can't bring myself to say no to this yet. Uh, I mean, I, I, we're, we're adding to, um, we're adding a, a nominal amount to our infrastructure inventory, um, but we have to take care of it anyway. And uh, the irony is that it was suggested that well, what if utilities needed to uh, have access to pipes on the south side of the building? I mean, why not serve people who are going to build the building in the first place? Like, uh, what future building are we worried about serving? Uh, it just doesn't seem worth this much scrutiny. Uh, I mean, like, I'm willing to punt this issue 50 years down the road. Like, I, I, I don't feel terrible about it um, because I just... Uh, let's build it already. I, I and Council Volan, my apologies. I thought this was going to be a question. We I thought it was too, and I'm and, struggling with this. It's going to be a this. final comment, but here's the thing. <laughs> We're working on a possible amendment with respect to the dedication well, of then the plaque. Well, then I, I withdraw so my if comment. You, but, if uh, we want to maybe stick with questions for just a little bit until we get something maybe in writing that we can I, consider. I just hope that my struggle was uh, illustrative or uh, illuminating to you. My colleagues, thank you. All right, so um, Council Member Smith, do you have a question? I, I have a question. Very good. <clears throat> so this is to Mr. Lucas, and, uh, and he's, he's probably thinking about an amendment right now. So, so I'm, not, I'm not an attorney. If we amend it and say that we would vacate it based upon BZA uh, approving it on Tuesday, can we do that? Is that an appropriate amendment to the ordinance so that we can say yes, but if they say no, then it's moot for us? I think no. Um, uh, I, I think the, uh, the decision is uh, the council's to make as to whether to vacate this or not. Um, uh, I think conditioning the vacation on uh, the decision of the Board of Public Works judgment as to whether to, to accept a new alley uh, would be improper. Um, uh, that's my opinion. I think it's, it's a debatable point, but uh, that's my take. Um, I, I think uh, in an effort to give you all a sense of what the Board of Public Works is likely to do, uh, Mr. Seabor was invited tonight to uh, talk about staff's recommendation. Uh, and again, I've, I've noted uh, there's a, a window of opportunity for the mayor to uh, review uh, the ordinance. And uh, I, I think uh, Corporation Counsel Beth Kate uh, has, has indicated his willingness to help facilitate uh, the council's 
uh, predicament uh, in, in waiting to see what the Board of Public Works might do, um, if that helps ease concerns. Um, uh, again, if, if the mayor were to wait for the Board of Public Works to act, uh, his 10 days would extend beyond that, and he, uh, through a veto, could, could send this back to the council for further consideration. Thank you for your opinion, Mr. Lucas. I, I rely on you to keep us out of trouble. Thank you. And uh, where are we with respect to any kind of amendment language? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to display uh, the text of a hastily written amendment uh, that uh, reflects what Councilmember Piedmont Smith was, was uh, asking about. Uh, if you give me just a moment. I see a hand up from Mr. Cordero. Is this in response to any of the council questions that you've heard? Yes, I just wanted to um, also mention a couple of things. One, you know, obviously, our we we heard a lot about the need for housing. Um, uh, so, and and I'm I'm getting to sort of the 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 tax dollars and the maintenance, um, you know. Of, of public ways, um, right of ways, you know, our project will, you know, add significant tax dollars to the to the tax base um, if if approved and, and we can go through and build it. Um, so there's there's you know value in multiple fronts in us you know completing this project. Uh, the other the other point that I, I wanted to bring up was uh, in response to the utilities and and our proposed location for the stormwater uh, management. You know, we, we've yet to be able to have the discussion with, um, with the Board of Public Works and the engineering department in earnest. Um, we, we believe that you know, we could probably propose alternate locations. This, is the, you know, this was the, the simplest one from our engineering standpoint, we can move that. Or uh, there's, there's alternative sustainability options uh, that we could look into as well. So um, I don't think that the the location of that proposed stormwater detention uh, should be a major consideration if potential future utility use is is of significant concern. Um, I think we can work around that and we're willing to work with the engineering department and the Board of Public Works to figure out a a solution that everybody's happy and comfortable with. Um, so I just wanted to, to point that out that um, I think if, if this does go through, um, we're willing to, to work with engineering and Board of Public Works uh, on, a, on the best solution for um, our necessary utilities. All right, thank you for that. Are we ready for any kind of amendment? Yes, I'm happy to share uh, an amendment that Councilmember Piedmont Smith may wish to introduce now. Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, introduce Amendment 1 to Ordinance 2215. And this is to um, put into the record uh, a commitment to create a historic um, marker uh, of considerable durability and <laughs> weight. Uh, on the site, uh, particularly to commemorate the and explain the smokestack. All right, that's, that motion has been made. Do we second. have a second? All right, and uh, before we um, go to council for any questions on that, do we have a response from Mr. Cordero? Um, yes, I, I would just uh, propose that we put a dollar amount on here. Unfortunately, I don't know what the appropriate dollar amount would be. <laughs> Again, we are talking about a commemorative marker. We're not talking about a piece of art. Understood. Um, I think, you know, as, as it was proposed, the seven to ten thousand dollars, I think, is, you know, a reasonable amount that we you know, said yes, we would we'd be able to agree to. Um, so, I I guess I I just don't like the open endedness of it. Um, so that that was all. That was my suggestion. 
Could we add that range to the language? Could it be a range from seven to ten thousand dollars? I would. Um, I would welcome that uh, amendment to the amendment. It has to be made by unanimous consent technically at this point, and I would prefer um, actually that it's an upper limit, not a range. What if 6,500 is deemed adequate by all parties? I think up to 10,000 makes more sense than specifying seven to 10. And I would withdraw my unanimous consent to amend the amendment unless uh, that's agreeable. Withdraw my consent. Good point. Council Member Sims had a point. Council Member Sims. Thank you. Um, I do have a question for Mr. Cordero. Uh, many, many conversations earlier um, when we were talking about uh, the large amount uh, for art dedication. Um, and I do believe Mr. Cordero said at some point his reluctance to do that. But then th there was something he said, and I thought it was a $10,000 amount or something. Well, what? Do you recall what that is without me looking at minutes or anything? Because I think that would be a good common ground place to start, if you can remember what that was. I think I, it was. I don't remember the exact dollar amount either. I think that was probably in the neighborhood um, of what I was thinking for this very purpose, for um, a plaque or um, a dedication, um, you know, information plaque or board uh, for this very purpose. Well, I mean, if we're looking for a fixed amount, I, I thought that'd be a place to start. Um, yes, that, I, I had yeah. that in mind as well, yes, because it was mentioned in the summer. Yeah. Um, but the question, I suppose, now is uh, whether that should be the upper limit, whether there should be a range. Um, I welcome other input from my colleagues. Well, I'm, I don't have a question, but I do know to move forward, that's going to be more discussion discussion, and particularly on quality. Um, I don't want some little limestone thing and some other stuff, you know. I mean, we've got some pretty significant designations around town that are pretty darn good quality. It's going to last and significant. So, and I know we can't do that tonight, maybe. I, well, I don't think we can. But I don't want to miss that opportunity, either, if that makes sense, if that makes sense. So. Um, well, I would be uh, willing to, um, first of all, withdraw my amendment to the amendment and then make a new <laughs> new suggested amendment along the lines of what Council Member Flaherty said um, uh, to put a maximum of $10,000 on the investment. All right, that change has been reflected up there. Is that, uh, does that need a second? I think it, we need unanimous consent to amend the amendment. All right. So let's uh, let's have the clerk call the roll on that. If we are looking at the, uh, you, you can simply ask if there's an objection to, to this change to the amendment. And I, I will also note that uh, Mr. Seabor, if you you'd like to chime in, uh, has indicated that ten thousand dollars up to ten thousand dollars should be a sufficient uh, figure to cover uh, similar historic markers that, that are around the city. All right. So. If we are satisfied with that, are there any objections to the new language to the amendment? And seeing none, can we assume that this has passed, this amendment to the ordinance? I believe the amendment to the amendment uh, has been incorporated. Uh, the amendment as amended is now still, still the council's and uh, can, can be voted on as soon as you're ready. All right, so I believe now, unless we need to go to public comment on that, any yes. public comment on the amendment? All right, anyone from home? I will uh, offer the chance for folks on Zoom. If you'd like to offer comment on the amendment as amended uh, to the ordinance, uh, you can use the raise hand feature to uh, let us know you'd like to speak. And if there is no further public comment, I do believe we are back to council comments. Yes? Any, any further burning questions before we go to final comment? Point of order, this is just on the amendments that we still have to vote on the amendment itself, correct? 
Oh, we still have to vote on the amendment. All right. So um, all in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Now, back to final comment on the matter before us as amended. Council Member Flaherty. Thank you. Um, I'm going to support the vacation of the alley. Uh, I think um, it, it seems to me like, like it's a close call for staff as well. And we're, I, I kept hearing reasoning kind of on both sides uh, of, of keeping or vacating alleys. Um, there was, doesn't seem to be a, a substantial difference between the current uh, red striped alley we saw in that image versus the proposed blue striped alley just to the south. Um, there are some differences, but I don't think they're uh, all that material. Um, so applying the exact reasoning shared by the administration as to why they would not recommend dedication of the proposed blue alley, if we apply that reasoning, then in fact we should be voting to vacate the red alley tonight. Um, and that's what I intend to do. Uh, and um, I guess I should also clarify that for, that for me, my vote's not actually contingent on the dedication of the, the blue alley either. Um, I'll defer to staff on their recommendation to the Board of Public Works um, if they don't think it's in the city's best interest at that point. Again, applying that reasoning consistently, I think we should vacate. And if they want to recommend uh, uh, a negative uh, finding for the BPW, that's okay with me. Um, I think also the fact we, we kind of glossed over, didn't discuss this much in the past, uh, we talked about affordable housing as one type of uh, uh, public benefit that we like to see potentially uh, in a context like this, but we didn't actually talk about the sustainability features that the um, project, uh, the, the design that's been approved uh, will incorporate. Uh, so there's kind of two pathways to uh, the incentives portion of the Unified Development Ordinance. There's an affordable housing component and there's a sustainability component. Um, so especially given the fact that um, the proposed design as approved by Plan com Commission contingent on this alley vacation will incorporate those features and also be adding, um, yes, market rate housing, but in a uh, important uh, sort of downtown infill location, I think, uh, that aids uh, walkability um, and even for folks who drive uh, lower emissions generally because they're close uh, in proximity to, to amenities and jobs. Uh, I think this is uh, enough of a public benefit that it, that it makes sense to me. Um, and with that, uh, yeah, I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Additional final comment. Council Member Volan. So I'm uh, looking at the, uh, the memo uh, and I'm just going to sort of follow through uh, this section. Please recall the following criteria which have been previously established by the city to guide the review of a request for right-of-way vacation. And there are two points. One is the current status, access to property. The current utilization of the right-of-way in question as a means of providing ve vehicular or pedestrian access to private property, churches, schools, or other public places for public utility or drainage purposes or for other public purpose. So the exception of the potential difficulty of running pipes that may be needed someday for some theoretical development there, uh, it seems that, that this request uh, complies with this condition. Uh, the second point is necessity for the growth of the city, and there's four subpoints: A, future status, the future potential for public utilization, possible future need for the right-of-way due to future changes in land use. I mean, uh, we are literally talking about a future use. It's just the near future. Um, like, th th that's not an argument against this, the, this project. B, proposed private ownership utilization. The proposed utilization of parcel in question, if it reverts to private ownership, the potential for increased benefit to the city under private ownership. In other words, does the proposed use contribute to the orderly growth of the city? Well, this process has been nothing if not orderly. Uh, I think that uh, they have uh, been uh, going through the very orderly process to build a building. Uh, you know, if the building is not sufficient, providing su enough uh, public benefit, and it seems like we've already argued that there is a significant public benefit being made by this project. So I think this point is, is okay. C, compliance with regulations. 
the effect of vacation upon compliance with all ethical regulations, subdivisions, zoning, access control, off-street parking. In other words, does the vacation present a non-compliance problem or hinder future compliance upon anticipated development or change of use? I mean, we could just sort of uh, wait for the perfect development to come 50 or 100 years from now or 10 years from now. Uh, but is this development good enough? It seems like it is. I haven't heard a strong objection to it. And finally, relation to plans, the relationship of the vacation with the master plan, thoroughfare plan, neighborhood plans, or any special studies that might apply. Well, the thoroughfare plan, we've already established that the Beeline Trail, which was created because a railroad went through it, is there in perpetuity. We know that. Like the, this city would not exist if the trail would, were no longer you know, or somehow built over. I just don't see that ever happening. Uh, it's hundreds of years old. Um, the master plan, Mr. Flaherty has pointed out that there's, you know, <coughs> benefits to this project that they uh, are asking for it because they, they, went, they went for sustainability incentives. So there is a public benefit. Um, and, you know, what neighborhood? The neighborhood is two buildings served by this stub uh, that's always going to be a stub. Uh, and we're not even getting rid of the stub. And I still have trouble with the conflict between do we want the stub or don't we? Um, so I, I, I do understand the principle, but we've debated this an awful lot. And it just seems like the right thing to do is to swap the parcels. And that's what I'm going to vote for. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for a final comment? Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, I, I know that this has been a, a long process and I do appreciate everybody's patience with this and I think it has um, overall been very educational uh, for um, everybody involved. Uh, I uh, am not opposed to vacating the alley and even if the Board of Public Works uh, decided not to accept the new right of way, I would still vote to vacate this alley. Um, I do think that public right-of-way is, is valuable. However, um, in this case, it is an alley stub that will never go anywhere. Uh, there is a historic smokestack, which is historically protected uh, through action of this body in the middle of this uh, right-of-way. And even the new proposed right-of-way, as well as the current one, um, stub onto the Beeline Trail, which, as my colleagues have said, isn't going anywhere. So uh, I think in this particular case, the disadvantages outweigh the advantages of maintaining this uh, right of way as, as a public asset, uh, because the disadvantage is you gotta take care of it. Um, so uh, I am, I'm pleased to hear the, that there's still a commitment to a uh, historic marker so that um, uh, future generations will know what this stub of a smokestack is all about. Um, but I will be voting in favor of this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilmember Sims. Thank you, and I apologize for my confusion. Is this final comment on the it's amendment final. or the ordinance, as, the ordinance as, amended. as amended? As amended. Thank you very, very much. Um, one of the things, and, and maybe I'm just slow, I don't know, but I think one of the whole things we were talking about in the first place was that basin underneath, the retention basin. Um, so I guess my question is, how big of a unit are we talking about? I don't think I've ever heard that. And what does it take to maintain um, that basin? I, I mean, I don't know if that's even such a thing. When's the last time has it been maintained, if that was an issue? Does, does anyone know how big this retention basin is? And has it ever been maintained? I mean, what does that require? I see a hand up to answer Mr. Yeah. Sims's question. And the petitioner has agreed to do it. I just, from my standpoint, I just kind of want to know what it is we're talking sure. about. Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, the, so the basin itself uh, is a, it's a prefabricated structure. It would be actually three long cylindrical tubes um, that are side by side. Um, each tube is approximately 36 inch, for 36 to 48 inch in diameter. Um, and 
they would be about 30 to 40 feet long. And then each tube has a manhole lid that allows visual access inside. And as far as maintenance, so again, there's really no nothing to maintain in there other than one of the tubes would have a valve at the end of it that would lead into the existing city stormwater structure that would connect to it. So um, other than that, it's just a, a, a galvanized steel tube uh, buried underground. So it's, it's it requires visual inspections and I believe that the city has requirements uh, from a code perspective of how often those need to be uh, inspected and reports provided to the city. And I see Mr. And to, further, to further clarify, there is no existing stormwater sure. basin. This is something that we would be putting in as part of our sustainability um, requirements for our new development. Correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. They clarified some things for me. Thank you very much. All right. Any final comments from other council members? And seeing no more final comments, let us call on our clerk to call the roll on Ordinance 22-15 as amended. Council Member Smith? Yes. Bolin? Yes. Sims? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? No. Flaherty? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. And Piedmont Smith? Yes. All right, and that passes. Eight, one, zero. And again, thank you very much to everyone's patience. This has been a long process and hopefully on to the Board of Public Works. Thank you. All thank right, you all. we are now ready for our next agenda item. Madam President, I move that Ordinance 2233 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Moved and second. All in favor say aye. 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 And will the clerk please read? Ordinance 2233 to amend Title 10 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Wastewater Rate Adjustment. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance amends the rates and charges in Title 10 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Wastewater to meet revenue requirements for operation and maintenance expenses, ongoing debt service payments, and capital improvements to the wastewater collection and treatment system, including ongoing modernization and efficiency improvements and mechanical screen replacement at the Dillman Wastewater Pl Treatment Plant, mechanical rehab and replacements, plant hydraulic expansion and end of life equipment replacement at the Butcher Pool Wastewater Treatment Plant and ongoing system improvements throughout the collection system including installation of additional lift stations and, intercepts and interceptors, INI reduction and the ongoing sewer lining project. The rate adjustment will be implemented in two phases as follows, a 12% increase effective January 1st, 2023 and a 6% increase effective January 1st, 2025. You do not have a committee recommendation. Thank you. Are we gonna move it? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I move that ordinance 2233 be adopted. Second. All right, Mr. Kelson, the stage is all yours. Good evening, Council. I'm Vic Kelson, Utilities Director. I have with me in chambers Jennifer Wilson of Crow. She's the financial analyst who will be reporting as well on this matter. Uh, on Zoom, our assistant director for finance, Matt Havey, is on. Uh, our assistant director for environmental programs, Kat uh, Zager, is on. Uh, our assistant director for engineering, Phil Peden, is on. And our assistant director for uh, operations, Hector Ortiz Sanchez, is also on. Uh, I do not believe that James Hall was able to make it tonight, uh, but if he is, he would also be on Zoom. Uh, in addition, Chris Wheeler of City Legal, who does our representation, is also on Zoom. So 
they're all available to answer questions should they come up. So, uh, as I've said many times when I've spoken to council, the purpose of the uh, utilities direct department is to provide safe and sustainable water, wastewater and stormwater services in an economical manner, promoting uh, public health, prosperity, and quality of life in our community. Uh, you, you all know, uh, I've said this many times, uh, that our goal and our objective is to be recognized as the finest municipal utility system in the state. Uh, and uh, working with council over the last six years, uh, we've done a lot of projects together. Uh, we've made a lot of things happen. Uh, and we've been improving every step of the way. And I want to thank you for your past support of our efforts. And I'm happy to talk about uh, what we're talking about doing in the next four years in the sewer utility. Uh, we'll also talk about stormwater as, as the next item. Uh, we are, as was uh, in the synopsis, we're asking for a total increase of 18.7% over two phases. That's 12% uh, in 2023 and 6% in 2025. Uh, we're, uh, th the purpose of this is, first of all, of course, to cover inflationary increases in our operations and maintenance costs. Uh, this will help us complete the, uh, com the, the, allow us to complete the expansion of the Dillman Road uh, capacity to 20 million gallons per day. Uh, that ar need arises from a 2016 letter from IDEM, the Indiana Department of Environmental Management, uh, indicating that uh, we were approaching the capacity of that plant and we needed to be able uh, to be working towards increasing the capacity. Uh, we're also uh, planning to prepare our sewer works for anticipated gr growth in the Blucher Pool Basin by planning for a possible future expansion there. Uh, we'll expand the Clearwater program that's been established uh, that would reduce infiltration and inflow into our sewers, which would uh, remove the amount, uh, uh, remove a certain amount of the storm water that makes it into the sanitary system, and then complete the design work for some major in interceptor projects. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, we'll talk a little bit first about what we've done with the rate case uh, that you approved in 2018, and then uh, continue to talk about what we're doing uh, over the next four years. So uh, since uh, 2018, we've done a lot of work on the sewer side. Uh, we've, at the Dillman plant, uh, we've uh, implemented some algae control uh, in our clarifiers. Uh, we've added positive displacement blowers for uh, the digesters. When the plant was first assembled, uh, both the digesters and the aeration basins were fed by the same blowers, so they, they, we had to maintain enough pressure to, uh, to operate the digesters at all times, uh, even though that was more than we needed for the, for the aeration basin. So now we've separated that out. Uh, the positive displacement blowers allow us to do uh, fine control of the amount of air that we put into the digesters. Uh, in the aeration basins, we've added uh, new, new diffusers to some of the basins. Uh, we've added new pumps, replaced all the existing pump, previously existing pumps. Uh, for the return activated sludge, or RAS, and waste activated sludge, or WAS, um, and, and then the scum that comes off the top. Uh, we've also uh, added multi-stage, uh, more efficient blowers to the system and closed loop control of dissolved oxygen. So all of these things are very much modernizing uh, the operation of the Dillman uh, plant and bring it much closer to the state of the art. Uh, we've also, uh, one of the big limitations in our capacity going into this project was uh, the, uh, the finished, filter, finished water filters at the end of the plant. Uh, that was one of our bottlenecks. Uh, we've added a new filter that's a standalone filter uh, called a disc filter. Uh, it's a completely different kind of operation uh, and it's incredibly small for what it does. Uh, we also have made some improvements to our disinfection systems at Dillman. Uh, we've done uh, improvements to our uh, uh, supervisory control and data acquisition, or SCADA, systems, and done a lot of plant-wide improvements as we've added all the new stuff. Uh, we replaced the roof, uh, and by many electrical improvements, uh, you wouldn't be surprised when you spend $23 million on a 40-year-old wastewater plant, an awful lot of what you do is replace conduit, cable, and switchgear, because that stuff is all, uh, is all reaching end of life. 
We also did some non-CIP uh, projects. These are projects we did at Dillman that didn't appear in the capital improvement plan the last time. Uh, some of those uh, are designing the phase two of the Dillman upgrade. So that's the part that will get us to 20 million gallons per day. Most of that's associated with uh, solids handling and the digesters. Uh, we've made uh, improvements to disinfection control and replaced some disinfection systems at Dillman uh, and then uh, uh, added new controls to the filters and uh, did some other effluent filter improvements. So those are uh, smaller projects that we did separately. At Blue Tree Pool, uh, we've made improvements on our aeration basins. They now all have fine bubble diffusers uh, and uh, are much more efficient. Uh, we've implemented phosphorus removal, which is required by the new uh, NPDES, that's National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit uh, that lets us operate the plant. Uh, we uh, never had to remove phosphorus at Blue Tree Pool until the most recent permit went into effect last year. Uh, we replaced the ultraviolet disinfection system at Blue Tree Pool, uh, replaced and improved the non-potable water system that lets us use water that's been treated but isn't ready for uh, discharge rather than using city water to do uh, certain operations inside the plant. And again, we replaced the roof uh, at Blue Tree Pool as well. And another big part of spending uh, capital dollars uh, in the uh, uh, wastewater world uh, is obviously our collection system. Uh, we have a lot of old, uh, over 300 miles of sewer pipe in the city, and uh, some of it's uh, in variable condition, some of it's pretty old. Uh, we've done a lot of sewer lining projects. We've been doing those for, uh, for quite a while now, uh, and rehabilitating manholes. Believe it or not, uh, well, sewers leak, and when they leak, they leak in typically. So stormwater leaks into the pipes and ends up as uh, sanitary water in that case. So we have to treat it. Uh, manholes turn out to be one of the places where a lot of water can leak in. Uh, we also did a CIP project for the off-site sewer uh, at the IU Health facility. Uh, I don't know if you remember this. Uh, this project was to, uh, when the new hospital was, con was site was, uh, was selected, uh, that location actually sits in a troublesome spot where there was no sewer uh, service at the time. And the choice was made to send it to Blue Tree Pool. And in that project, uh, we built a lift station at the hospital and then a force main that goes all the way around to the north side until it discharges into a gravity sewer uh, at Martha uh, Street. And that water then goes to the Blue Tree Pool plant. Uh, IU Health had a certain amount that they were contributing to the project. We contributed to the project as well because we have a chronic sewer overflow location on the uh, interceptor sewer uh, along College Mall Road right across the street from Bloomington Hardware. Uh, that, what we've done is added a new valve and made it possible for us to divert the flow from our Tamaran lift station uh, to the new sewer that goes to Blue Tree Pool instead of going to, uh, to the Dillman plant, which it normally does. Uh, we can operate this valve in times of high flow, and it takes, if we have, after a large storm event, for example, it takes about two million gallons per day of flow out of that College Mall road interceptor and sends that additional flow uh, towards Blucher Pool. So that uh, helps us prevent, uh, gives us another way to operate our system and to, to control overflows. We've also done a bunch of non-CIP projects. Uh, we've done uh, relocations, uh, engineering, and uh, construction for relocations owing to uh, I-69. Uh, we did a survey uh, and floodplain modeling for the Winston Thomas property, uh, where uh, there's, uh, it's been a large portion of that property has been identified by FEMA as floodway. It really isn't, and it never was. It was a uh, a, uh, a wastewater lagoon. Uh, so uh, we're trying to get that uh, reconsidered by FEMA. And in order to do that, we had to remodel it. So the, that modeling's been done. Uh, we also did sewer rep improvements from North Dunn Street up to the Blucher Pool plant. Uh, again, IU paid 41% uh, of that project. And the reason for that is that uh, IU is sir, uh, IU demand is about 41% of what the, that sewer is carrying. 
So they have uh, helped us to pay for that project, which serves uh, the area around the stadium, uh, new dormitories and so forth, but it also serves uh, a lot of the, uh, the new apartment complexes and so forth up along the north side near the stadium. Uh, that also cuts down a lot of our infiltration and inflow uh, going to the Blucher Pool plant. Uh, we're also, uh, one other thing we do in terms of capital uh, spending is that uh, uh, we pay 60% of the lease, pur lease purchase agreement for the solar installations at CBU uh, from, from the sewer. We'll be doing that till 2025. So our goals for 23 to 26 are uh, to achieve 20 MGD uh, at the Dillman plant uh, and then prepare for anticipated capacity growth uh, in the Blucher Pool Basin. And we think that that's going to be an issue down the road, whether uh, the annexation uh, petition ultimately passes or whether it doesn't. We expect there will be growth in the Blucher Pool Basin and then we'll be serving it. Uh, we uh, also continue to replace aging and end of life uh, equipment in the plants and the collection system. Uh, of course, we want to continue to eliminate, uh, improve our system resiliency and eliminate sewer overflow locations. And to do that, we have to make some really uh, uh, large engineering decisions uh, going forward about how to do that. So in order to do that, uh, we will be conducting design studies for infrastructure improvements, especially uh, for major interceptor projects that will all be very expensive projects that we hope to be uh, able to compete for federal dollars uh, to assist with those projects. In order to do that, we want to be shovel ready. So we are going to do, out of this rate case, one of the big things we're going to do is four uh, major sewer interceptor design projects. We won't be building them, we'll be doing the design, and then we'll be seeking uh, funding to carry out those projects, either through federal grant dollars, uh, other grant dollars, or uh, future rate cases. And then uh, this rate casing does include uh, dollars for a possible new service center and garage for CBU at the Winston Thomas property. Uh, I'll ask Jennifer Wilson now to talk about the financial report and, uh, and needs, in the, and uh, I'll leave it to her. Take it, Jennifer. Hello, I'm Jennifer Wilson with Crow, and we were tasked with uh, preparing a rate and financing report for the sewage works. Just to give you a little background of what we do, we take a look at all the financial data. We look at a test year ending April 30th of 2022. We look at the income statement balance sheets. We scrub that test year to make sure that all the operating expenses are truly reflective of what's going to be happening in the future and look at your budgets. Then we take uh, that operating, um, uh, operating expenses and create into, and the capital improvements, sorry, add the capital improvements that Director Kelson talked about, and we create your revenue requirements, and that includes your operation and maintenance, your current debt service, using the capital projects, we'll fund some of those with pay as you go cash, and we'll also be funding some of those with uh, proposed debt issuances. So when we got to the end of the rate case, we made some consideration or we looked at what is really funding or what's causing the rate increases that we're going to be proposing here of 12% in phase one and 6% in phase two. And generally it has to do, you have increasing operating expenses from the last time we looked at your rates. Your expenses have, will be increasing to an additional $2 million from what we looked at at the last time we had the rate increase. And then all the capital projects that Director Kelson talked about, those are needing to be funded and primarily with debt service and you have a pay-as-you-go component that you have been funding and we're gonna continue that. This schedule here shows the year 2020, 2021 and the test year ending April 30th, 2022. You can see there in 2020, the revenues were down slightly probably due to COVID, and your expenses were maintaining where they were, and you had uh, approximately $1.4 million for pay-as-you-go capital improvement. The yellow line, or a yellow bar, indicates your operating expenses, your current debt service, and so basically the little blue shows how much money you had available to fund any capital projects from ongoing revenue. It improved somewhat in 2021, increasing to $5 million, 
And then as our test year, we looked at ending April 30th. It also maintained about $5 million. But as we look forward into your operating expenses, we are seeing that you have approximately $1.2 million additional operating expenses over that test year. So it's eating into that $5 million that you had available. I've listed up here quite a few of the items that we made adjustments to. Some of them are decreases, some of them are increases. But some of the highlights are uh, we're increasing for your budgeted 2023 expenses for salaries and wages. That's about 700000 And then the related FICA and pension is in another $150,000 increase. You have an increase in your purchase power expenses of approximately $245,000 due to the great increases at Duke Energy. And then we had some other decreases, but overall, all the adjustments that we made increases your operation and maintenance and taxes by $1.2 million. Uh, this, this graph is a little busy, but basically it shows all your departments and the total amount of uh, operating expenses of 14 million, then you add taxes to it, so your total operation and maintenance and taxes is about 15 million. But you can see most of your uh, big pie pieces have to do with the operations at the treatment plants and transmission and distribution. Uh, Director Kelson already kind of spoke to these items, and I, I will we'll just pass on here, but this is a, basically a summary of all your capital improvement plan that's gonna be happening over the next five years. We're really gonna focus in on the first four years uh, because we anticipate that you'll be coming back in another four years and relooking at rates at that point in time. Here's kind of a summary of what we see, how we're going to be funding that five-year plan. Uh, the item in green is the amount that we're gonna delay uh, to the next rate case. The item in blue is a, a proposed 2023 bond. The item in yellow is a proposed 2025 bond. The light blue is the proposed, uh, proposed service center financing, but that's showing the full amount of the financing. Um, part of that cost will be shared with water. Water is going to be responsible for about 40% of that. And the item in red is uh, approximately $3.9 million annually that you'll have available to fund the, pay, the rest of the projects with pay as you go. So what's this happen to debt service when we fund all these capital projects that we expect to do with two bond issues? Your dark blue has to do with your current outstanding debt. We're gonna add on the 2023 bond and the 2025 bond and the proposed financing center. So currently your debt is about $4 million. We're gonna increase it by $4.4 million um, by the end of phase two. So here's the summation of everything having to do with the sewage works of the rate increase. Pie chart shows the amount in dark blues, the operation and maintenance, the yellows, the taxes. Sorry, I have to always look because my eyesight's not so great. Uh, the item in light blue, it has to do with your debt service and that's where we're increasing it by $4.4 million. You have your two leases that you're already paying on and then the annual equipment and replacement at $3.9 million. So in essence, you're able to fund most of your items. We're wanting to do some more capital improvements, adding on debt. We need an additional $4.4 million in debt service, and we're needing to raise $4.4 million in two phases of rate increases. That is a 12% increase, phase one, again, starting in January of 2023, and a 6% rate increase in January of 2025. And that's the next ordinance, so I, Uh, so this, this is uh, the, what ends our presentation. Uh, we are doing these uh, every four years as council requested. Uh, so uh, we will expect to be back in 2026 uh, to, fin to follow on what we've been doing uh, here tonight. Uh, so I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Jennifer is here to yeah. also to answer questions and we're happy uh, to do anything we can. All right, very good. Council questions, and I see hands up, Council Member Rollo, and then Council Member Piedmont Smith. Thank you for your presentations. Uh, Director Kelson, um, so looking at the total uh, expenditure summary uh, of to total wastewater out to 2029 is 82 million plus mm -hmm. some change. 
Um, and I, I'm, I'm trying to discern, and it's difficult for me, and perhaps you can give me some, uh, you can elucidate this. If, if I'm looking at this, say, from the perspective of maintenance and improvements other than expansion, so there, I'm looking at two components. One is maintenance and then improvements other than those related to expansion and then expansion alone. What, what percent would you say would be the expansion? I think Jennifer is probably the best person to answer that question. <laughs> I think it's maybe 50-50 or maybe... Uh, yeah, I don't have that number, okay, but I well, could get I wondered, it for you. Yeah, I was kind of going through and trying to discern that, and it looked like maybe it was about half. Yeah, I think so, it's okay, about we're, half and we're, half. We're agreed on that. So, so what I'm curious to know is, um, so what policies are in place for expansion uh, where the costs are internalized to new users? That is, why should existing users subsidize new users of a wastewater utility? Well, actually, uh, Council uh, implemented a change to, to, to handle that a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, we came with a petition to change our connection fee, and we raised the connection fee by a very large amount at that point. Yep. And that additional uh, charge is, is called a system development charge. And that system development charge that's been added to the connection fee is there specifically to offset the cost of future increases to the capacity of the treatment plants. So in other words, we're playing catch up right now. Is that we what are playing saying? catch up, yes. Okay, so we, we have in place policies that will prevent this sort of subsidization. That but, will, at, yeah, that will. but at this point, we're being told by the state, you're going to be over capacity. Yeah, we're going to have to do something. And, you're to, and you've got to do something about it. And, and the thing is that if we don't do something about it, if we reach the point where we're regularly uh, at or over our capacity, what the state can do is deny new requests for, uh, for new developers to connect to our system. So we really need to make sure we have available capacity or all the discussions we have about building houses and other things become much more difficult for us. Well, and of course we don't want that because then they, have, they do private and That's right, right. wastewater treatment and then it goes into the ground, groundwater. Um, okay, well, I'll stop there. I have another question soon. Thanks. Thank you. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, thank you for your presentation. Um, I, perhaps it's in uh, the report uh, from Crow somewhere, but what I was trying to find is the figure of how much more you expect to take in from ratepayers uh, after um, the phase one increase takes effect. Yeah, so in overall, the, we're expecting to take in that deficiency of $4.4 .4 million, and that's broken up in phase one of adding $2.63 million by the 12% rate increase, and the remainder of $1.56 million in the phase two or 6% increase, totaling 4.4 over the two phases. So that's the total amount taken in per year? Yeah, well, that's the amount that we're needing to increase our revenues because of the deficiency between what we're operating revenues currently taking in versus um, the proposed revenue requirements. Are you asking what the total revenues are going to be? Sorry, I, I might not be understanding what your question is. Um, what I'd like to know is, so after phase one and then after phase two also, uh, what what do you expect the new, the, the increase in income to be? It would be that 2.6 in, yeah. in phase one and one and a half in phase two, roughly. And is that per year? Per year, yes. yes. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. And, and, I, and I do apologize. Uh, uh, I, it, I left the slide out of the presentation that had the amount that that, what that means to the average customer. Uh, the average Bloomington customer is around uh, 3,500 gallons per month. That's about three and a half units. Uh, that number is in the table in the back of the book, and I believe it's uh, it's between three and four dollars a month for the average Bloomington customer. Residential. Residential, yes. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Councilmember Sims. 
Thank you. Thank you both for the presentation. Um, it's getting late and I'm a little bit giddy, I think. Um, but your comment, you want to be the finest in the state. And I think that's a worthy goal. And I think you know that I support what it is we're doing. But in your mind, if we were to be the finest utility in the state and we could do that today, how much do you think that would cost? Ballpark. To do it all today? Yeah, yeah yes, yes. So you could be Ooh. the finest utility today. <laughs> um, uh, that's a great question. I, I don't thought know it that, was, yeah. I don't know that I could flip that switch, but uh, yeah. uh, I think to be the finest, you aspire to it and you keep working at it. And I think we are definitely one of, fi one of the finest in the state. Oh, I would um, agree. And, so, okay. and we are, uh, we've made great progress the last few years. Uh, if you. If you think back to all the things that you know, we've all worked together on, um, we've done advanced metering infrastructure for the entire system. Uh, almost nobody in the state does that. Uh, we've uh, uh, done capacity expansions uh, throughout our system. We've replaced sewers. We've started water main replacement. We've been uh, and new GIS. We've uh, new SCADA systems. We've done an, an astonishing amount of things to modernize uh, our entire operation. So uh, we're making progress. I think we're certainly in the top few in the state and, uh, right. and we're gonna keep after it. And again, I think we all support that and I know I do. And I've been on the board for a lot of years, so everything you just mentioned, I think we all know. So just, <laughs> <laughs> just for that. Um, you mentioned infrastructure prep. Um, I guess there was four different areas um, to prepare us so it could be shovel ready to be ready to receive federal dollars. Um, if you could give it a percentage on what, what do you think is a percentage that we will actually get those federal dollars? Because we're making a big investment. And I know we're doing it to hope it, but what if we don't? Well, we're going to do those projects eventually, what? whether whether we get grant money or not. So, okay. the idea is to is to move the engineering forward so that when dollars become available, either through the state or through the feds, or um, maybe we'll win the lottery or something. But you know, it's uh, uh, when when those kinds of things, you know when uh, I, that was a joke. Uh, but when federal dollars become available, typically those are prioritized to projects that are ready to go. So our intention is to be ready to go. And if, if the federal f dollars or state dollars or whatever other grant dollars don't manifest themselves, over coming rate cycles, you're going to see us up here asking for dollars to do those projects one by one. And we'll prioritize them according to their impact on the community. Thank you. And that's kind of what I'm getting at. Because when you come and ask us for much more than we're asking our rate payers to do that. And so it, it builds and builds. So that's right. kind of where I'm going there just a little bit. Um, may I go, Madam Chair? I'm sorry. Um, there was some question with needing some of this rate increase to help offset the cost of the street sweeping that you'll be taking over. So is that part of this or that's wastewater? Water that's feet. the next one. So you want me to wait till then to ask you that? or It would be better, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, just put this on your mind. I think there was an additional 300 grand, and I want to know why. So okay, we'll when we get there. Okay. Um, thank you, and that's all I have. I'll have some comments right. about some Any things. other so questions from Council? And Council Member Rollo. Uh, Director Kelson, um, so we've, we've discussed a, a chronic problem. Uh, it occurs around the 3,000 block of Olcott Boulevard in High Park, and that is um, sewage backups, people's basements. And mm -hmm. I see there's an allocation under the collection system projects of a, of a lift station at is Edwards Lift Station, I assume LS's lift station, is that what yes, that is? Station, yes. And uh, is that something to remedy this problem, or could you? Could you describe? Yeah, actually, I, I, I neglected to mention that in the presentation, yes, but several of the projects we're doing are lift station replacements for aging lift stations. Um, the particular location you were talking about, we've recently installed a check valve uh, there to prevent, to prevent that particular eventuality. But we do have lift stations that do occasionally trip out 
after big storm events, and then the, then there can be backups, and that's why we're doing the replacements. Yes. Gotcha. So the so it's been remedied. The one on Olcott, the problem on Olcott is is been. It's that, yeah, we, that work was done a few weeks ago. Okay, terrific. Thanks. Additional questions, Councilmember Scambolori. Yes, thank you, and thank you for the very detailed presentation that you gave us. Um, I guess I just want to ask your help. We have constituents uh, who are just this month seeing the impact in their paychecks of the new ED lit um, and who are absorbing that. They, it's entirely likely they've not heard of Blucher Pool necessarily <laughs> um, or the Dillman plant per se or anything like that. What two or three things would you have us tell them about the necessity of this? Well, and you got at it a little with the catching up kind of thing, but could you help a us A little with bit that? with the catching up. Uh, the, the big thing is that, that sewers do back up sometimes and sewers do overflow sometimes. Uh, we do have some locations where our sewers can overflow. Uh, we need to do infrastructure work to prevent that from happening in the future. Uh, there may be opportunities for us uh, to get assistance with replacing those sewers because that's each of those projects is in the tens of millions of dollars. That's a very expensive proposition. So uh, when, when we talk about engineering some of those major infrastructure projects, what we're really trying to do is poise, uh, put ourselves in a position where we're ready to go uh, if, if there are monies available. And there may need to be matching dollars. We, we don't know how that's all gonna work out yet. So one of the things we're trying to do is put ourselves in a position where we're ready to chase whatever we need to do in the future, whether that's uh, additional demand growth in the Blue Pool Basin, uh, leading to capacity issues there, uh, whether it's uh, sewer overflows that threaten public health and the environment, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're addressing those kinds of problems. Plus, we're saving, uh, we're doing everything we can to operate as efficiently as we can. So when uh, we replace blowers, we use less electricity to, to treat the water. Uh, so uh, any of these kinds of things, so we're modernizing, we're upgrading, we're making the plants uh, more efficient to operate uh, and uh, pr protecting public safety. Because we had, um, during the course of the, uh, of the uh, Dillman expansion, uh, there was something unexpected that happened uh, that was not part of the project. And that was we had uh, one of the main feeds, electrical feeds to the plant, which is a cable about that big around. Um, it actually shorted out. And when that happened, uh, you know, we had to do an emergency contract for three quarters of a million dollars to replace that, that feed. Those are the kinds of things that you can't, can't put up with. You need, when you've got 40-year-old 40, 40 equipment, it's at or beyond end of life. You really have to replace it. We don't have the option of continuing to take risks because if that feed had gone out and another one of the feeds had tripped out for whatever reason, we would not have been able to treat wastewater and the city's sewage would have flown, flowed into Clear Creek. That's why it was an emergency. So uh, we're trying to put ourselves in a position where uh, those things are taken care of ahead of time, and we know, um, uh, and we know that we can uh, uh, approach the future confidently and uh, continue to improve our ability to treat the city's wastewater. Thank That's you. That's a long answer, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> Sorry. but thank you. <laughs> but a good one, <laughs> Councilmember P. Munt Smith. Yes, related to that question. Um, can you uh, please review the ways that uh, customers who are having trouble paying their bills uh, have some recourse at CBU? Yes, uh, we have a customer assistance program uh, that we fund. Uh, it's administered through the South Central Community Action Program, SCAP. Uh, people who need help uh, can have their bills uh, paid for uh, uh, several times a year. Uh, and that's water and sewer. Uh, the important thing is if, if you're behind and you, uh, 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 and you need to make a payment, do you need help making a payment, it's important to, to contact us 
uh, before you get disconnected because after you're disconnected, our options are a lot less flexible. Uh, we do reach out uh, to customers and make sure they know about this when they get into uh, situations where they're in arrears. Uh, we did see uh, in 2020, during the worst of the pandemic, uh, we did see an increase in the number of customers that were in arrears uh, each month. Right now we're back to about where we were uh, prior to the pandemic. So uh, that, uh, which is optimistic, but certainly yes, we do have programs to help. Uh, there's also uh, some uh, community organizations that help as well, and we, we work with all of them. And how much money is set aside for that? Uh, this year's budget, I believe it's $50,000, uh, and uh, it was in, the numbers were in the 2023 budget presentation, and I can't remember what they were. But it's uh, several hundred people uh, that have had help this, uh, this year. And I think townships are also a source for people. Townships can help. There's also uh, the federal government has the lie heap uh, thing that where you can get help with your heating bill. There's also a lie weep that can help with water bills. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I know we do participate in some of those things as well. Thank you. Any other council questions? All right, seeing none, we go to the public. Anyone wishing to make a comment on Ordinance 22-23 regarding our wastewater rate adjustment? And I see someone approaching the podium. We might want to make the announcement to anyone home on Zoom. Yes, uh, I will extend the invitation for folks on Zoom. If you'd like to comment on this ordinance, please use the raise hand feature to indicate you'd like to speak. You can find that raise hand feature in your control bar under the reactions tab or the more tab. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to speak. I would also like to note that this uh, public comment opportunity serves as the statutorily required public hearing on this item. All right, and we will have three minutes for comments. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Sandy Washburn. I live uh, in town here. And I guess maybe this question kind of came up, but I wonder if there are impact fees charged to developers not connection fees, but impact fees. I know that other cities around the United States have done this. I think, uh, I don't know what the statistics show on like, you know, discouraging development, but it seems to me that we have a lot of people that want to develop here, particularly a lot of rental property that costs people a lot of money. And I believe that a lot of our utilities are being taxed, if you will, you know, over, overly taxed by a lot of development. And I wonder why developers aren't paying for it. Why am I paying for it? So that's all. I, I just encourage the council to maybe look into impact fees beyond connection fees. Thank you for your comment. Anyone on Zoom? I see no takers on Zoom. All right, we are back to the council for either additional questions. Any questions? Council Member Rollo. Well, uh, referring to Ms. Washburn's question, which is excellent, what, could, you just, could you answer that? Um, are uh, the connection fees adequate, or do we need impact fees as well? Um, actually, in, in a couple of ways, we do. Uh, so I'll talk about two of them. We do need them, just to clarify? Or we, we do them. them. We do them, okay. Um, Thanks. So historically, here's what's, what's happened. Uh, in the past, uh, what would happen is, uh, if the inf it would happen with water pipes and also with, with sewer pipes. If you put additional demand, eventually you get to the point where the pipe isn't big enough anymore and a developer would come to do a project and it would require, say, a 16-inch sewer to be made into a 20-inch sewer, picking numbers out of the air. Uh, we would uh, require that the developer pay for that expansion. Now, that's really not a very good way to do things because um, that 20-inch expansion is serving all the people who've been adding on for the last 20 years, plus a bunch of the people who will be adding on after the expansion is done. So that's really not the best way to do it. Uh, we encountered this when uh, we did the North Dunn Street sewer. Um, our first reaction, our first thought was, well, IU, it's, you're building the additional demand, you're gonna have to pay for the new sewer, 
and they didn't think that was fair, and they were right, uh, because other people would be taking advantage of that increase in capacity. So what we did on that project was we did a memorandum of understanding with, with IU. Uh, they contributed to that project. We paid the rest of the project. And then as new projects, new developments get added on, they'll be paying their fraction of the additional capacity as part of their connection fee. So they get their connection fee plus part of paying off that North Dunn Street sewer. Uh, and that model, we think, is an effective one. And we're looking at pl other places where, where, we, uh, where we'll need, need to do that. So uh, the, the basic concept is current rate payers pay for the expansion. New, on new projects that come on pay, pay their part of, of that expansion afterwards. Because you've got to have the sewer before you can have the development. Then that, so that's one way we're doing it. The other thing we've done uh, is um, we're funding a Clearwater problem, a project. Um, I know Council Member Smith, you live in Park Ridge East, right? Um, there are a couple of projects that have been built recently, uh, uh, notably the, the large one at the Kmart, former Kmart property. Uh, that project was going to put additional demand on the sewers uh, that serve that entire College Mall Road area there. Uh, those, that sewer is, uh, is actually overtaxed uh, during large rain events, but during normal flow, it's not. So what, uh, what the developer agreed to through a memorandum of understanding was they uh, paid us a certain amount of money to help us fund the identification and elimination of uh, illicit connections to the sewer uh, the, uh, and, and replacing them. So for example, uh, if you have a sump pump in your house and it's connected to the sanitary sewer, that's wrong. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to send it to the stormwater infrastructure. The idea is uh, how do we find those and then how do we go to the customers and say you have to fix that? Uh, the idea is that with those dollars, we're actually looking for them, doing inspections. We offer the inspections for free, and then we offer to do the improvement for free to eliminate that water from the sewer. So rather than asking the developer there to replace a $6 million sewer, we actually ask them to give us the money that it would take to offset their normal flow from the sewer. And we've actually done that in several places and that's funding our improved uh, Clearwater program that's designed to reduce the amount of infiltration and inflow of, of st stormwater into the sewers. And we worked that plan out with IDEM that, as an alternative. So just to follow up, is it worthwhile to have a study that would indicate to us whether these provisions that you were discussing just now have done what they were intended to do, that was to internalize costs such that if there are new users, they're paying the expansion. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I realize that we're kind of coming up to a point where we're implementing this, mm -hmm. and so, um, but, I, but I'd like to know if it's going to be effective. In, in other words, are, you know, is, is that the case, that they're paying their and, fair share? And that, that is, very much part of what we're doing. These, these uh, uh, elimination of, of illicit connections, that program is very much a pilot program and we are testing and evaluating everything as we go along. So, so you'll have data in the future that we can discuss about yeah. the effectiveness of yes. these? Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, any other questions before we go to final? All right, any final comments before we call the question? All right, seeing none, we'll uh, All in favor of Ordinance 22-33, say aye. Oh, no, wait, let's call the roll. Sorry, having a little tr trouble turning on the microphone. Okay, uh, Council Member Voling? Yes. Sims? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? <clears throat> yes. Flaherty? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Piedmont Smith? 
Yes. And Smith. Yes. Thank you, and that passes 9-0-0. And now we're up to our next ordinance. Sorry, Madam President, I move that Ordinance 2234 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Moved and seconded. Will the clerk please read? Oh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Now will the clerk please read. Ordinance 2234 to amend Title 10 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Wastewater Stormwater Rate Adjustment. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance amends Title 10 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Wastewater by amending Section 10.08.045 rates stormwater, stormwater utility users by increasing the stormwater fee from $595 to $750, an increase of 26%, to allow for appropriate funding of necessary improvements to the stormwater system, which includes additional design work, repairs, and construction of the Hidden River culvert system and Spanker's Arch, as well as open channel improvements to Clear Creek, which are all intended to reduce flooding in the downtown area. You do not have a committee recommendation. Thank you. Madam President. Madam President, I move that Ordinance 2234 be adopted. Second. All right. Uh, uh, Vic Kelson, Utilities Director. Um, the picture you see behind the uh, title slide here is part of the construction of the uh, so-called Hidden River Project. Uh, that was quite an operation, and we're sure glad it's finished. Uh, as uh, the Synopsis said we're requesting an increase of 26% in the stormwater fee uh, for the average residential customer. That's well for any residential customer. That's a dollar and 55 cents a month. Um, and our major goals for the rate cycle uh, are to replace downtown storm sewer infrastructure, uh, to improve our residential grant program, uh, to dredge the basin at Miller Showers Park. Uh, to build several new green detention facilities, and to adopt and improve our street sweeping program to protect the MS4, that is the municipal separate storm sewer system. I'll say MS4 from now on. Uh, but uh, uh, we'll, come, we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Uh, we're gonna talk briefly about what we've done since 2018, and then talk about what we're planning to do uh, in 2023 to 2026. Um, uh, we'll talk first about projects were recently finished. Uh, this project is one that uh, we're actually very proud of. Uh, the, this is a detention basin uh, over uh, in the, the Somax neighborhood uh, where the neighbors actually suggested that we talk to the uh, people at the Deer Park for, uh, property to see if they would allow us to build green detention on the property there to protect the neighborhood. Uh, we, it took us a lot of effort to get this thing built because uh, when the bids came in, it was far above the engineer's estimate. Uh, so we rented bulldozers and other equipment and bought the materials and we built it in-house. Uh, so this project uh, came out great. Um, the neighbors were really helpful as we were building it and it, uh, all in all, I think everybody's pretty happy with it, although we haven't had a storm that filled it up with water yet. Um, we did revenue bond projects related to the so-called Hidden River Project. That's Clear Creek um, uh, flowing from the campus down to First and Washington. Uh, we did engineering services and then the culvert construction uh, that was recently finished. The picture on the left uh, is a modeled simulation of the 100-year storm event. Uh, it's actually, this is a storm event that's a little bit bigger than the storm event we had in June of 2021 that flooded uh, Kirkwood Avenue. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, that a sizable portion of downtown would be flooded by that 100-year storm prior to the construction of the new system. Uh, the figure on the right illustrates uh, what the model predicts uh, would be the extent of flooding uh, after the projects are complete. So uh, uh, we finished the first part of that project, which is the tunnel under the city. What's left to do now is the inlet at the upstream end near Franklin Hall uh, and Sample Gates. And we're working with IU uh, on that project uh, to, get that, to get that set up. 
that last bit of this project will uh, be part of the, the current proposed uh, fee increase. We also did a lot of uh, projects uh, through uh, extensions and replacements. We did that uh, uh, culvert replacement on South High Street. That was a big culvert that was actually starting to fail. Uh, we finished removing Weimer Dam. Uh, we completed a st stormwater master plan for green infrastructure development, and of course the Devon Lane detention basin that I showed just a moment ago. Uh, so here are some of the goals, uh, the major goals for 2023 to 26. Uh, we'll complete the Clear Creek Tunnel, that's the up, upstream portion uh, near Sample Gates, and the Spankers Branch has a tunnel uh, on east of uh, downtown, or sorry, west of downtown. Uh, that we'll be replacing as well. Uh, we're going to be improving our residential grant program uh, to do a better job of serving uh, lower income neighborhoods. Uh, we've seen a tendency for the uh, residential grants to end up in, um, to not always serve uh, the lower income portions of the community and we've been striving to make that uh, be a much more equitable distribution. Uh, Green infrastructure efforts. Uh, when we established the green infrastructure funding back in 2018, uh, when we established that, one of the questions was, what are you going to do about maintenance? Well, maintenance turns out to be a big part of it. And uh, Miller Showers Park is a green infrastructure project, and it needs to be cleaned out. It's full of, full of mud. Uh, we'll also be building some additional uh, green detention basins and other locations in town. And then adopting and improving the street sweeping. I, I probably should talk about that a little bit at this point. So the thing is that there are two reasons that you sweep streets. One is to protect the street infrastructure and to clean up after accidents. Uh, also to facilitate the improvement of street infrastructure. Uh, for example, after they do a milling operation, it has to be swept. Uh, that we see as public works' responsibility because that's all related to the, to the street. The other reason you, streets, you sweep streets is to keep stuff out of the MS4, to keep things out of the storm inlets because when they get full of, full of mud, we have to vacuum those out just like we do the basin at Miller Showers Park. So one of the things that, that uh, we think the city can do a better job of is preventing uh, debris and contaminants from flowing from the streets into the storm sewer system. So our, our work would be dedicated towards developing a street sweeping program specifically oriented towards protecting the, the MS4. So that might include things like uh, asking uh, neighborhoods to park their cars on the other side of the street on the days that we're going to sweep. So there's public outreach associated with all of that. Uh, but right now, we really don't go out and sweep under where all the cars are parked. And by the way, that's where the inlets are. So we want to focus on gutters and inlets and also focus on uh, specific areas of town where uh, stormwater infrastructure is regularly degraded, damaged, or incapacitated by uh, litter from the street. So our portion of the program is dedicated towards doing a better job of keeping things out of the stormwater infrastructure as opposed to just general street sweeping. Um, and I'll ask Jennifer to talk about the, the financial portion. Just as we did on sewage works, we went through the same kind of analysis on the, on the stormwater utility. So here we show on the blue again is the revenues and the yellow represents your current debt service and your current other expenses, leaving uh, about $1 million to $1.3 million each year for extensions and replacements. We're looking to maintain that level. Um, as Director Kelson said, you're taking on an additional $250,000 of street, street, uh, street sweeping expenses. And also there's an adjustment for additional wages and salaries of approximately $250,000. So that amount that you have available for extensions and replacements is gonna reduce, and thus that's why we're needing the rate increase. He went through the capital improvement plan. Here's the summary of that capital improvement plan. Most of it's gonna be funded from extensions, annual extensions and replacements 
that's going to be coming in from rates. There is a bond issue component of that, that we're going to be increasing a debt by about $321,000. And then there's a little bit of a grant that's, that's anticipated to pay for that part of that plan. So here's the, here's the total revenue requirements. Operation and maintenance expenses and taxes are about almost 1,475,000. Then we have debt service of approximately 1,280,000. And then an ongoing extensions and replacements of 1,329,000. So we're needing an additional $825,000, which annually, which necessitates a 26% increase. And as Director Kelson said, it's about a $1.55 increase to the ERU. Uh, here's that summary of the sewage works and the stormwater bills increases. But again, like I said, your bill for ERU would be increasing from 595 to 750. The sense of formal presentation are happy to answer any questions. All right, very good. Thank you both. Um, questions from Council. Council Member Rollo. I had a question about um, with the prime rate increasing or the bond rate, is, is, is that becoming problematic? What is the... You, oh, you mean interest rates? Yeah, interest, yeah. Uh, we have not sold any debt since we saw the, since the interest rate started to spike up, but, but it will be an issue coming coming next year. I have another question. Um, oh, and by the way, I, I, I might mention here, this is another reason why we want to do the engineering studies because up to, since I've been here, uh, market funding for, or market financing for bonds has been uh, much more cost effective than the state revolving fund. So we haven't been seeking state revolving fund dollars, but that could change as interest rates change. And to do state finance projects with the, with the SRF, uh, we actually need to have the engineering study done first. So uh, it's worth, worth our while to have, to have that done. Okay, I, I guess my, the, the point of my question was to ask whether or not this has had any impact on the, the study that your firm has done to date because it's a sort of a, it's a floating Yes. Target yeah. right now, right? And, and so what we've developed in our study is a level debt service. Okay. At the time of financing, the municipal advisor will be able to look and see if there's other options available, such as buying a surety bond instead of funding the debt service reserve with the bond issuance. So there are some slight modifications they can do at the time of the financing to help offset some of that um, rate increase that potentially could happen at that future date and time that you're selling bonds. So there are some things that they can be done at the time of bond issuance. Okay, that's good to know. So my specific question, um, Director Kelson, was about just to see if this was on your radar because it's, it's something that uh, everybody has. Many people have stormwater problems, there's no question, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure your list is long. This one is a, is a very large one. It's on Manor Road. It affects about nine household, households. It's just east of Bryan Park. Uh, the drain runs through people's backyards and it goes into Sheridan Creek. And it turns out CBU doesn't have an easement where this stuff runs. That's right. Is that on your radar? Do you, are you We've discussed it. Uh, we've discussed it. It's a really complicated problem. But yeah, we'll, 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 we can look into that a bit more. I can get back to you on that. Okay, so we can work together on that. All right, thank you. I'm glad you know about it. Yeah, we have problems in lots of places with stormwater. Um, do you have any idea the percentage of when we mill streets and you said we have to sweep after that, uh, what percentage of that is actual contractors and how much is we do in-house? Do you have any idea of that? Um, I've, I'd have to ask Adam Wason that. But I think a lot yeah. of it we do. I think a lot of it the city does, but I'd have to talk to Adam. Which means we'll have to clean up after ourselves. No, we, we don't do it. Uh, street sweepers. The street. That's what I'm talking about, yeah. Well, the street department will retain street sweepers for the purpose of doing that. So they wouldn't be calling CBU and saying, hey, come street sweep the street. They would be sweeping sweeping those really? things or, or, okay. or emergencies. Thought operations were switching, so I was a little confused That's right. with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, 
I guess the street sweepers themselves, and maybe you know this, are they gas operated or diesel? Uh, I think that depends on the model. I think you can get Okay, which way. models are you getting from Public Works? Uh, I don't know what oh, we're getting from, that, okay. uh, which one we're getting from Public Works. One of the things that we want to do is get what's called a regenerative street sweeper, which is a strange sounding name. Yeah. Uh, what it does is it takes the air, it's basically, a street sweeper is basically a big vacuum cleaner. Uh, so what it does is it takes the air that's being blown out and it recycles it into a hose and a, and a jet that blows uh, stuff out of the cracks and breaks debris loose from the street that you can then vacuum up. So it does a much more effective job of, of cleaning the streets than the, than the standard brush and vacuum street sweepers. Okay, I have one more, thank you. Um, in both the ordinances, there was uh, this line in, in both of them um, that we needed some of that revenue in order to make payments in lieu of taxes. Tell me what does that mean? with regard to your revenue for utilities? Uh, that's money we pay to the city, isn't it? Yes. Uh, so the, it, the pilot is money we pay to the city because we are, we are sitting in the city, but we're not taxed. It's, it all shows up in our interdepartmental agreement every year. Yeah, let me think about that. Uh, why don't we do that with churches? Yeah, I think the, I uh, think well, that, that, I mean, we're not part of the city, but we are part of the city. And well, in lieu of taxes, so it, it's kind of like magic money, it seems it, to me, because we don't pay taxes anyway. Well, it's making up for the revenue that the city might have received because if the property was used for something other than us. But it has been used by us. No, but CBU is funded, the, the, the reason for it is that CBU is not funded by, by general fund dollars. We don't get any income tax, we don't get any property tax. But the city, the, the civil city, loses out on some property tax because our facilities are sitting in places where that might have been a private operation. So we're making up for the property taxes that would have been paid by another user of the same property. Okay, do we do the same thing with Bloomington Transit? That, that, that you're aware you don't know? Okay. I, I don't know. Okay, no, I'll ask. I'm that's a Jeff that's, Underwood question. <laughs> well, it's kind of the same offer yeah, setup, uh, but I'll, I'll find out more about that. I, but, I, I just want to know about that question. I saw that and it kind of struck me as a little weird. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember P. Mount Smith. Yes, um, I wanted to ask, uh, I'm, I'm happy to see that some of this. Uh, New revenue will go to the neighborhood stormwater improvement program, especially for people in low-income neighborhoods. Um, how much of the revenues would go towards that? Uh, as much as we can. Uh, we, we, we're we budgeting uh, about the same as we did the, the previous year, uh, which is between seventy dollars and $100,000, uh, depending on engineering costs. Uh, what we want to do, what we've discovered is that uh, when you go to do a project, first you have to know there's a need for it. So you can, the first thing you have to do is identify the need. The second thing is figure out what to do um, and, and then design it. So we've always been working with engineers uh, who the various customers or various residents have brought in to help them do their design. Well, the problem is uh, people in lesser served neighborhoods uh, tend to not have the background understanding of the stormwater system. They just say, hey, it floods every year. And they, they're, they're much less likely to come to CBU and say, hey, help us out. So, uh, but we've identified places where uh, some work could be done on two or three adjacent properties that would make a big difference. So our, the, the idea is that we would reach out to, to uh, to residents that had those kinds of problems specifically for that purpose, to say, we've identified a problem, there may be a way we could help, and then we'd, we'd be able to use some dollars that way. Because we, we've, we've realized we've been trying to increase our outreach, and we want to go even farther with our outreach to try and make sure that there's uh, real equity in the way those dollars are spent. So uh, as far as the funding, it's not 
Uh, it's to continue the program. It's not really to increase the amount. That's right. We'll continue the program uh, and consider it part of our green infrastructure program because that's really where it's, these, those projects are all green infrastructure projects. Yeah. Okay. I have another unrelated sure. question. Um, and this is uh, something that I mentioned via email. Uh, and I just want to get it on the public record, and that's that the, the, U, the Utility Service Board resolution um, has uh, in its whereas clauses 18% uh, rate increase, whereas it should be 26%. That's right. That was the typographical error in, the, in, the, in, that, in, that, present, in, that, uh, in that document, yes. Okay. Yes. But it, since it's just the whereas clause, it doesn't uh, that's right. have a legal impact. So. That's right. Okay. Just wanted to get that out I, there. I, I confirmed that with Chris Wheeler today just to make sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions from council? Council Member Smith. Thank you, Director Kelson. You, you know what's popping up in my mind about, so you're talking about uh, a robust street sweeping to help with um, uh, getting things out of storms sewers that so it would prevent so how does that square with you know if, if people in the fall don't get their leaves sucked up does that not push the burden towards you all um, and I've you know I've had people asking me about you know the leaf program and all and and so how does that how does that gonna work with how do you think about that? Well there there are always a lot of leaves that don't get sucked up. Um, and and our hope, I think the 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 plan is to is to get people to bag their leaves as they do in many other communities. But there'll always be leaves that don't get bagged. There'll always be leaves that don't get raked. There'll always be get be leaves that get blown into the street right off the tree. So um, at this point, I can't predict how many more leaves might occur uh, from, from not sucking them up. Um, it, it is better for the environment overall if people either bag their leaves or mulch them. And, and sure. I think that the cities, uh, in terms of, of environmental sustainability, I think that encouraging people to bag them or mulch them is far preferable over uh, going out there with giant vacuum cleaners. Um, and vacuuming them up. So um, I think it's going to require a lot of effort on everyone's part to make sure that to, to make that program be successful uh, going forward. But yeah, leaves that end up in the street are going to end up uh, having to be swept up by the sweepers or they'll end up in the, in the, uh, in the inlets. Will your program uh, educate the public like if there's in the fall lots of leaves in this area I'm thinking of one in Park Ridge East near where I live <laughs> that regularly has a lot of water because the, there's so many leaves that go down to the one area. Mm -hmm. Would they call the utilities and say help or how, how would that work? Well, there's a couple of things we do. Uh, one of the things that we already do is we have an adopt an inlet program. So you can adopt a storm inlet. Uh, we'll teach you how to rake it out, um, teach you what to do with it when you rake the leaves out of the storm inlet um, and you know we'll, we'll certainly be grateful for any assistance people will do with that um, uh, I, I do believe over time and as we talk you know we, we, this is going to be an ongoing development so uh, if we start talking to the to the uh, residents about doing things to help us do a better job so move your car to the other side of the street because we're going to sweep next week right um, that would be great uh, some places there are actually ordinances that require you to do it. I don't think we need to go that far. I think we should try to do it voluntarily first. Uh, but there are lots of things that we can do um, going in that direction. Uh, we're really, one of the things that a couple of people have asked me, I'm going to answer a question nobody's asked, if you don't mind. Um, a lot of people have asked me, uh, where does this, the idea of us doing leaf, uh, or street sweeping as part of our MS4 program, where does that, how does that compare to what other communities do? Well, it's very common for street, sweep, or street sweeping programs to be in the MS4 program, 
That's really a, it is a common situation to do it that way. It's not uncommon. In fact, if you look at the, we have a separate NPDES uh, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit for our stormwater program and street sweeping is specifically mentioned in that permit as, as an activity for us to be, uh, to be involved in. So uh, we really are uh, conforming more, this whole proposal is to conform more to uh, the standard way that the, this type of thing is done. Um, we're gonna start and uh, if, assuming uh, if this gets approved, we're gonna start seeing what we can do to make the, the, make the program better. Um, obviously, we'll be measuring a lot to measure how much we collect, um, uh, measure the, you know, we can also keep track of things like how much sediment did we have to pump out of storm drains, uh, those kinds of things. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Councilmember Rollo. Um, yeah, this, I, I want to make note of the Deer Park Detention Pond because it appears to be a really great project that people appreciate it, and this is capturing runoff and releasing it slowly that would otherwise impact a, a substantial part of that neighborhood. And I wondered about, so I'm going to call it the Big Dig. I don't know what you call it. Which one? The one just finished? The one you just finished. Oh, the Hidden River Project. The Hidden yeah. River. Okay, it's a Hidden River. Um, so... You know, we, we, we have flooding on Kirkwood. Will that mitigate that flooding? Or is it, is it really going to require doing something upstream that is likely in, say, Dun Meadow would be the, 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 an ideal place, right, for a, something similar? And have you engaged IU if that is the case? What is, what's the, how is that dynamic working out? because you know, we had massive flooding in Kirkwood. It's happened before, it's likely gonna happen again with climate change and 100 year floods every five years or whatever. So what, do you have, I'm, I'm could you asking, reflect on that? I'm asking Mr. Lucas to put the presentation back up. There, there you go. Um, so the figure on the left is the 100 year storm. Uh, with the, with the infrastructure that existed before we finished the project we just finished. So this is, this is the 2021 infrastructure with the 100 year storm. The 100 year storm is a little bit bigger than the storm we had in June of 2021. The picture on the right is what the model predicts the flooding extent would be uh, if that same storm happened after we finish all of the projects. And what we've done, I don't know if there's, is there, there's no laser on this thing. Um, we finished the underground portion through downtown, but we haven't finished that inlet right there at, at Franklin Hall. So when that inlet is completed, this, that, this is the model of what will happen after that inlet's completed. Now recently we were asked, um, how will the system function um, now uh, if we had that same storm today, but before we do the last project? And basically, the area that's flooded would extend basically over the parking lot behind, behind the Von Lee, uh, quite a bit of it back over there. But it really didn't get very much into Kirkwood. It was mostly, it was caught uh, from the inlets there behind the Von Lee. Uh, and uh, it did not appear to flood where the fire station is located. So um, it, we've made a lot of progress already. And when we finish the inlet, uh, we're going to have it mostly captured. And as you see, what would flood would be done meadow. So that's the first part of your question. The second part of your question is, yes, IU's been involved in all the discussions about this project. Uh, they're, they're certainly going to have some interest in the design of the inlet, um, uh, both structurally uh, and aesthetically, and how it integrates with the rest of their infrastructure there. Uh, and they'll, they'll be, they, they will certainly agree to have agreed that they know that they're gonna to contribute to the project. So that's all in there. Uh, the other thing that's interesting, if, can you have the map back for just a second? When that big flood happened, uh, when they ran the model and looked at that big flood, the water, it didn't all flood because of the, the, the inlet being too small. There's also a bridge uh, over closer to the Union uh, there and that water backed up behind that bridge and flowed across the north portion of Dun Meadow, crossed 
uh, Indiana Avenue and then came down behind uh, all came down sixth and behind all of the this the stuff over there so uh, we expect that the project will include some additional uh, we're, our, our the project proposal will include some additional grading changes uh, elevation changes along that western edge of Dunmeadow specifically to make sure that that more of the water is held uh, in because that's really the only green detention that's available on the IU campus um, that you know we will be talking with them about trying to make it so that more of that water would be retained there because the bridge isn't going away uh, we want to make sure the water stays uh, in a place where it's going to make it to the inlet so those discussions are are still ongoing and our engineer is working on a plan that's wonderful and I guess some of it is related to the amount of impervious surface up upstream as well yes is that are they considering that too as they yep, continue that's all building? in the model great okay thank you we've actually extended this model all the way down to I, I think all the way down to just above switchyard park so it actually captures all of downtown great thank you anyone else all right time to go to the public and if you're here in chambers step right up to the podium <coughs> Ordinance, please use the raise hand feature to let us know you'd like to speak. You can find that in your control bar under the reactions tab or the more tab. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to comment. And I'll again repeat the public comment portion of this ordinance serves as the statutorily required public hearing uh, for this item. All right, and we will begin here in chambers. And Mr. Lucas, I sent a stub. Hi, I'm Sandy. Thank you so much for being here. I can't imagine doing this on Mondays or Wednesdays or any day, really. Um, anyway, I've been here before. In fact, last time I was here, I talked about street cleaning and how important it was to inlets. This is my backyard. Uh, this is not the 100-year flood. In fact, I've been in this house for 20 years, and it's flooded like this at least eight times. So there's my backyard. That's an alley, by the way, behind that the city's never spent a dime to take care of. Um, so just right, that right away. Here's another alley. Uh, the picture on the right, or the left, sorry, is in the east side of my house. It's the most turned around in alley in all of Bloomington, I think, and um, also not maintained by the city. And that's the alley behind my house. This is just a typical rain. This is not any big rain. Um, yeah, next slide. So here's Prospect Hill, and um, the purple is the storm sewer, right? Mr. Kelson, that's just the storm sewer in Prospect Hill. That's all of it. And is there not a red line on there? Uh, can you click? Oh, no, I guess not. Okay, I'm not sure why it didn't come out. Anyway, the, the storm sewers, sorry, can you go back? take on all the water in Prospect Hill, right there. I mean, there's nothing on Third, Third Street is in that bottom quadrant. And since they put the curbs on Third Street, it all runs there and then down Fairview. Um, my yeah, house is there. Um, so I, I don't know. I think the storm sewer inlets there at Fourth and Fairview might take on 80% of all the water in Prospect Hill. Uh, next slide. Um, and yes, those are stormwater inlets underneath that water. Um, that's a regular occurrence. I call the city, I clean them. I will say after I was here last time, um, some volunteers came out from Centerstone, cleaned the streets. They did a wonderful job. I called them, I went out and talked to them, I gave them popsicles, it was great. But these inlets that are taking on all the water in Prospect Hill are just like too important for volunteerism. This inlet program, it's just not cutting it. And I didn't see any plan in there, but maybe there is. I mean, I applaud the street sweeping and this idea of cleaning um, the storm sewers. One more. And uh, yeah, so then the question is like, I go down and clean it out all the time. And then what do I do with it? Then I have to bag it up and then pay to, I mean, that, that doesn't seem right, that I've got to haul it away and then pay to have the city take it away. 
this is not, I don't live on this corner. <laughs> this is not my yard, <laughs> right? All right, so uh, yeah. And then I, this is just an example of where the debris is on the curb, the water shoots down the middle and misses the inlets. And, and so that's why street, clean, street sweeping is super important, I think. Yeah, one more. And then, you know, like I said, there's no drains on West Third. And, and then one more. And oh, there's the line. So that's kind of the top of the hill. Like that's the topographical map that the engineer sent me. And then you can see that green arrow. I mean, it just like shoots down Jackson or Fairview. And then my house is right there. Uh, one more. And so, you know, yeah, we got to clean the streets. I, I can't imagine we're not going to pick up the leaves. I can't imagine that. The inlets need to be cleaned regularly, and I can't, we're just permeable, pervious land. I, all, we're concrete to concrete. Where's the water going to go? Um, so like in Prospect Hill, I don't think we should do setback variances. I think we should preserve some land for the water to go into. So I'd really like the city to take care of the drainage problem in Prospect Hill. I've been there 21 years, and I've never seen any infrastructure improvement in Prospect Hill. So that's it. I'm probably over three. Sorry. Thank you, and thanks for providing that in our, in our packet this evening. All right, anyone from home? I see no uh, commenters on Zoom. All right, very good. If there's no more public comment, we are back to council for more questions or final comments. Council Member Bolin. I just have one question. Well? Well, okay. Uh, it's really complicated. So first of all, if the sewer is full of water, it doesn't matter how clean the inlet is. You can't get water, more water into it. So that's, that's part of the challenge. Uh, the other part of the challenge, and uh, this came up uh, uh, when I was here for the, the, the uh, water rate case, I think a year or so ago. Um, it turns out that location uh, near where your home is uh, happens to be a location that was a pond uh, before the area was developed. So uh, it, it's the bottom of the hill. So you go uphill in every direction from there. Um, uh, so there's no real way to move stormwater. It, it take, it, it's very difficult to figure out how to move the stormwater out of that location uh, to other locations. We have discussed it. Uh, the first thing is, uh, as you suggested, catch as much of the water as you can up at the top of the hill rather than waiting for it to get to the bottom. Um, and that's part of what we hope to do through the sweet sweeping program uh, to help keep, all, keep, keep the, the inlets open and get the water uh, off the street. But we, we will be, uh, this is an area that, that I've flagged as a place that we really need to look at um, as we go forward in the next, uh, through this next rate cycle. Well, uh, maybe what you can do for us is give us a sense of scale. In other words, you do some street sweeping now, right? None. I mean, there's never, never a time when you have to go clean out an inlet? Well, we go out to clean out an inlet. We do it with rakes. Okay. So, we so right now you're cleaning inlets by hand. Yes. And the city doesn't do any street sweeping, and you're proposing the first permanent, ongoing, comprehensive, pervasive street sweeping program for the city. The city does do street, street sweeping. Okay. Um, this area is an area that needs to be swept more often than it is right now. So my and question is, part of our program. how much more street sweeping will be done under your program than is currently being done? That all depends on, uh, we're, we're working with a contractor on a study to, de to design an the most effective program that we can with the dollars we have available. Well, I'm just trying so, to get a sense of scale, though. Like, is it going to be twice as much, 10 times as much, 100 times as much? It's going to be more like three or four times as much, I okay. think, is, is more likely for us, yes. Okay. And uh, will, I mean, you say you have identified this area, but you also have limited dollars, so... Uh, do you already have picked out areas that you know will get served by this new program? Uh, we have a few locations that we know are already chronic problem areas. Prospect Hill is certainly one of them. Can you name a couple of others just for the rest of us district representatives? Uh, off the top of my head, I can't, but I've seen them on a map. I mean, name I one other. Um, 
Uh, I don't want you to quote me on that. No, I can't, I can't uh, remember off the top of my head. I will get it for you and email it to you. All right. I'll send it all to right. council I mean, office. I'm just, I have a district too, so all right, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Roth. So just to follow up on this discussion about prospect. There goes my mic. Um, so first of all, it seems to me that, you know, the domain of leaf street sweeping being in your hands is probably better than in the street department because the street department is concerned about just taking away the leaves. You're really concerned about keeping those drains clean, I assume. So I'm, I'm expecting that the shift over to you is going to be, your department is going to be much better we're is, going, gonna, is it going to be, you We're know. going to be focusing on the portions of the street that are contributing debris to the MS4 uh -huh. system. So, yes, that's, that's precisely what we're intending to do. Okay, but the second part is, you know, it's, you seem to indicate that the infrastructure in, in Prospect Hill is inadequate. Uh, is there a remedy for that? Is this like pipe diameter? I mean, um, what, what does that consist I've of? I've talked with our engineers about it, and it's really complicated. Uh, I can't give you an answer to that right now, but I can get—I can talk with them and send you an update. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Any final comments before we call the question? All right. Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll on Ordinance 22-34? Yes, Council Member Sims. Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. And Voling? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, and that passes 9 0 0. Thank you, Mr. Kelson and Crow and um, everyone in your staff that was uh, listening in on Zoom. We are now ready for legislation for first readings. Madam President, I move that Ordinance uh, 2205 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Moved and second. All in favor say aye. 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 And will the clerk please read. Appropriation Ordinance 2205 to specially appropriate from the General Fund, Public Safety Lit Fund, ARPA Local Fiscal Recovery Fund, Parks and Recreation General Fund, CC Jack Hopkins Fund, the Rental Inspection Program Fund, Local Road and Street Fund, Parking Facilities Fund, Solid Waste Fund, Fleet Maintenance Fund, and Housing Development Fund expenditures not otherwise appropriated appropriating various transfers of funds within the general fund, public safety lit fund, ARPA local fiscal recovery fund, park and recreation general fund, local road and street fund, parking facilities fund, so solid waste fund, fleet maintenance fund, and appropriating additional funds from the CC Jack Hopkins fund, rental inspection program fund, and the housing development fund. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance appropriates various transfers of funds within the general fund, public safety lit fund, ARPA local fiscal recovery fund, parks and recreation general fund, local road and street fund, parking facilities fund, solid waste fund, and the fleet maintenance fund. Thank you. And I will be referring appropriation ordinance 22-05 to the Committee of the Whole. That is November the 30th. We have a week in between because of the Thanksgiving holiday. Madam President, I'd like to, to move that we discharge the Committee of the Whole uh, of, of its responsibility to hear this ordinance. Second. Moved and seconded, and we can have a discussion on this. It is my hope that the Council will indulge me. We have a lot, a lot, a lot at the end of the year. Anyone who's been President and has dealt with scheduling knows that things tend to stack up. I think all three of these items that we have in front of us are, are critical to hear at least twice before they come for a final vote. So uh, I would prefer that we refer it to the Committee of the Hall. Any other comments? Yes, Councilmember Flaherty. Um, 
I appreciate that, and I'm sensitive to those concerns and, and what we need to fit in before the end of the year. My, my alternative suggestion is actually to schedule a special session um, and cancel the committee the whole for November 30th. Um, I think th there are a number of reasons why that makes more sense, uh, including uh, granting us more flexibility and the ability to act uh, on some of these, should we feel that's warranted at the meeting on the 30th, uh, should it be a special session, uh, plus other benefits that I've mentioned and discussed before that, that uh, back my general reasoning for supporting uh, use of regular special sessions instead of committee the whole. Thank you, I appreciate that. And when we get to our council schedule, we will be recommending that we do hold a special session on the 14th. These three items, I think, though, would be better served in a committee of the whole. So anyone else? Council Member Bolin. Yeah, I'm, I'm sensitive to the time schedule, too, the time pressure, too, with the end of the year. Um, but I, for similar reasons, uh, the meeting is public, and uh, we're making the you know, concession here that um, uh, acknowledge, I mean, normally I prefer not to go committee the whole because I want a longer process. I want a four week, not a two week process. Uh, but recognizing that there's things stacking up, I just rather have that in a special session, not a committee of the whole. So that's why I would support it. Thank you, anyone else? All right, we have a motion on the table to not refer this to the committee of the whole. So will the clerk please call the roll on that vote? Pardon motion me. to discharge. Motion to discharge. All right. Let's see. Uh, Council Member Scambalori? No. Sandberg? No. Rallo? No. Flaherty? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. I'm sorry, what was that? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? No. Volan? Yes. And Sims? No. And that fails 4 5 0. Um, next on our legislation for first readings. Uh, yes, Madam President, I move the ordinance 2230 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 And will the clerk please read? Give me one moment, please. Ordinance twenty two third. Nope. Yes. Sorry. Ordinance 2230, an ordinance authorizing the issuance of the City of Bloomington, Indiana General Revenue Annual Appropriation Bonds Series 2022 to provide funds to finance the cost of certain capital improvements for public safety facilities, including costs incurred in connection with and on account of the issuance of the bonds and appropriating the proceeds derived from the sale of such bonds and addressing other matters connected therewith. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance authorizes the City of Bloomington to issue its General Revenue Annual Appropriation Bonds Series 2022 in one or more series in the aggregate principal amount not to exceed $29,500,000. The bonds will be issued to finance costs of constructing, renovating, replacing, repairing, improving, and or equipping certain facilities for the City's Police and Fire Department together with the cost of issuance thereof. We'll be referring Ordinance 22-30 to the Committee of the Whole, scheduled for November the 30th. Madam President, I'd like to move that we discharge the Committee of its responsibility to hear this ordinance. Second. All right, moved and seconded. Any further conversation? Yes. Um, I would just appeal again to my colleagues that it makes more sense to replace the Committee of the Whole with a special session, um, not least of all for the reasons that one member shy of a majority of this council uh, has real substantive um, 
problems with, with the Committee of the Whole and, and some of the public disservices that it causes. I understand that uh, a narrow majority of members don't agree with all of my substantive complaints, although they've refused to engage with them substantively to date. Um, while the previous ordinance, uh, my motion did not pass, uh, I believe the Council President could still unilaterally uh, decide to discharge the Committee of that duty and refer it to um, a second reading at special session on the 30th instead, um, along with um, uh, this ordinance should this motion pass. Um, so requesting reconsideration of, of this uh, generally for my colleagues, it seems uh, that there's no downside to considering a special session instead. If the majority feels it needs two hearings, uh, which a committee of the whole guarantees, all five of them can vote to send to a third reading on December um, December 7th or whenever that next meeting is. Uh, so there's literally no downside for your preferred process. Uh, what it would guarantee is that all of us are bought into the process and will certainly be in attendance on November 30th. Um, I, I can think of no reason other than stubbornness um, and sort of petty power dynamics to continue to force this to a committee of the whole on November 30th rather than compromising uh, among diverse views of council members. So again, I'll appeal to my colleagues to meet in the middle, uh, work together, and schedule a special session to consider this ordinance on the 30th. Thank you. Thank you for that. And once again, I will remind the council that we have an, an amazing uh, lot of things to consider. And sending something further down the road at the end of the year when we have so much that absolutely must be wrapped up um, is something that I, I do not consider a, a compromise, and I, I, once again, being called stubborn on this, I, I think is a little bit out of line. Um, I definitely, with this one, we are not getting complete information on this one, and I'm told we're not going to get it until the 28th. So I think this warrants a, a, a quite a bit of thoughtfulness, quite a bit of questions that we need to ask, and we're just going to barely get more specific information on this just right before the 30th. So for that reason, again, I want to refer it to the Committee of the Whole so we can listen to it twice before we do have to make a decision. This is a really big deal. Councilmember Bowen. The thing is, I think we are being thoughtful here. I mean, if it's true, and I've already, in the previous motion, pointed out that this uh, that I'm, I'm okay with accelerating the schedule because there's, there's important things coming. Uh, if, you, if you schedule special sessions every week for the next several weeks, or rather, regular session, special session, regular session, special session, those pieces of legislation that are not confusing or complicated can be approved at the special session. We don't have to come back to a, a regular session. We can have a second reading at a special session. So this would actually help the log jam. So, you know, we're not trying to be uh, necessarily, uh, uh, you know, contradictory for its own sake. Like, this is expeditious. So, if there's any piece of legislation here that the president or any set of members thinks might not be that complicated or we might be able to get through, we don't have to have a second reading. Uh, so, there's an advantage to a, a special session, besides the advantage that we see that it should be noted in, in, in minutes. Uh, so, you know, and uh, just, uh, we, we urge you to maybe not think that this is entirely out of spite. We're not being spiteful. Thank you. Anyone else? Council Member Rallo. Well, just to say that I've, I, again, I, I favor the utility of the Committee of the Whole because a special session a majority could adopt, could move to adopt, and I, I feel that these items, not all items, because sometimes we have opted to send them directly to regular session, deserve two hearings without any, so I, I risk of, of adopting that evening, and I'm not going to try to guess who is going to vote or which way in a situation like that. I just don't want it to arise. Thank you. Anyone else? Just a brief point of clarification that I did not call anyone stubborn. I said I can't think of a reason other than stubbornness uh, to support the or to oppose the motion. Thank you. Well, I just gave you one. 
All right, let us um, ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion on the table, which is to discharge to the Committee of the Whole. Council Member Sandberg? No. Rallo? No. Clarity? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? No. Bolin? Yes. Sims? No. Scambalori? No. Thank you. And that bails four five zero. President, I move that Ordinance 2235 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Moved and second. All in favor say aye. 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 And will the clerk Nay. please? Nay. All right. Call for a Let's vote. call for or a, a roll, call roll call vote on moving this forward. Council Member Rallo? Yes. Flaherty? No. Rosenbarger? No. Piedmont Smith? No. Smith? Yes. Volan? No. Sims? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. And Sandberg? Yes. And so that passes five, four, zero. And where were we in the process? Were you about to read? Do we yes. need to make the motion? Yes. Will the, will the clerk please read? Is that where we are? Ordinance 2235, to amend the traffic calming and greenways program incorporated by reference into Title 15, Vehicles and Traffic, of the Bloomington Municipal Code, regarding amending the traffic calming and greenways program incorporated by reference into the Bloomington Municipal Code Section 1526020. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance adopts an amended traffic calming and greenways program. The Traffic Calming and Greenways Program sets the standard for the prior prioritization and placement of neighborhood traffic calming and related traffic control devices and requires a consistent procedure for resident-led and staff-led processes. The amendments to the program include the addition of Common Council action as a required step in both the resident-led and staff-led processes and an increase to the percentage of affected housing unit signatures required as part of the resident-led process. Thank you. Madam Chair, can I ask who the sponsor of this legislation is? Thank you. All right, and I will refer Ordinance 22-35 to the Committee of the Whole on November the 30th. All right, at this time, we have additional public comment for anything not on tonight's agenda. If there's anyone in chambers or anyone at home on Zoom who would like to speak. I will uh, invite the remaining folks on the Zoom meeting to uh, indicate that they'd like to comment by using the raise hand feature in their control bar by clicking on the reactions tab or the more tab. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to comment. No hands flying up. Not that I see, no. All right, let us move on to the council schedule. We have quite a few things. Um, work session is Friday. Um, Councilor Lucas, if you'd like to walk us through that. Yes, just the normal reminder of uh, an upcoming scheduled work session this Friday at noon. Uh, there are several items of legislation coming forward uh, between now and the end of the year. I believe this is the second to last scheduled work session. Um, a uh, number of items coming out of the Plan Commission recently. I believe Councilmember uh, Smith noted uh, several of those. That includes a rezone along Fullerton Pike and uh, uh, both UDO text and map changes related to the Hopewell uh, overlay district. Um, a resolution is also scheduled to come to the Council December 7th uh, 
for an update to the city's ADA transition plan that I believe uh, Barbara McKinney and Michael Shermis have been working on. Um, there may be other items that come up, uh, but as, as of right now, that's what I uh, know of that would be ready for preview this Friday. So I'll ask my normal question if uh, members are interested in, in attending uh, so we can uh, decide whether to proceed with that work session or not. Thank you. Show of hands, how many people can show for the work session? All right, that's a sufficient number. Thank it's you. Nice we will go fun. ahead yes. and hold that. Um, I will say that um, with this discussion about the end of the year, um, we do have just a, a few meetings left to finish up the year. So I would like to suggest that we have a special session on December 14th in lieu of the committee. And that's because of all the numbers of things that absolutely must be wrapped by the end of the year. Uh, some of the other items that we've heard from, you know, Council Member Smith from the, from the Plan Commission can certainly wait. That 90-day clock can extend into February, but there are several of those items that need to be heard in addition to things that we already have on the, on the agenda. So um, at, as we just have a few more meetings to go, I would um, entertain discussion or um, a motion on including a special session in lieu of the Committee of the Whole on December 14th. So we will have regular session on the 7th, special session on the 14th, and then our final session for the year on December the 21st. So could we hear a motion? I'll make the, I'll make the motion of a uh, special session in, uh, in lieu of the Committee of the Whole on December 14th. Is that correct? Second. All right, it's been <coughs> moved and seconded. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Um, Madam President, I fail to see how this is any different from having a special session on November 30th, uh, which could actually be more expeditious since you say we have so much legislation coming before us. Um, it could be more expeditious than a committee of the whole. It doesn't have to be if we felt that a third reading was needed. Uh, so I. Can you please explain to me how having a special session on the 14th is okay, but having a special session on the 30th is not? Many of the items coming forward are resolutions, and therefore uh, those could be handled in, in one session. And I don't know if Councillor Lucas has any more to add. We're in the scheduling meetings, um, and uh, we've got quite a few things that could be dispatched in. Yes, I, I think. Uh if the council were to go ahead and schedule a special session on the 14th, there would need to be discussion on what items would appear on, on that uh, agenda. Uh, several of the items coming forward between now and the end of the year are interlocal uh, agreement resolutions uh, that could be taken up and adopted by the council in one meeting, so those might uh, fall to that special session on the 14th. Um, I think that's yet to be determined. Anyone else? All right, with that motion on the table, will the clerk please call the roll on holding the special session on December the 14th. Yes, Council Member Flaherty? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Volan? Yes. Sims? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. And Rallo? Yes. All right, that passes 9 0 0. And with that, I don't believe there's anything else we need to discuss about our schedule, so we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>